welcome to Dead Man Talking. Come with me as we step into the deep, dark forest of fear. And let's hope that we see sunrise in the morning. The Winlatter Forest Secrets. Let's get straight into that. So, we all set, asked Faye, my wife, as she loaded the last box into the back of the truck. All set, baby, I replied with my excitement brewing in my stomach. Her eyes said she too was buzzing to be on our way to our new dream home. We jumped in and pulled out of the driveway, casting one final glance towards our old semi-detached house. We had lived there since we first got married ten years ago. Now, with our savings and a good couple of investments, we had purchased the dream property with some land near a lovely remote disused quarry in a beautiful lake district. It was a risk to pile all of our eggs into one basket, yes, but to be honest, it was a steal. The owner had passed away and it had sat on the market for a couple of years. We literally couldn't resist. The home was a split level cabin with a basement and separate subterrain double garage. The quarry nearby offered some amazing views and I was hoping maybe I could build a lakeside cabin in the quarry and start a fishing farm. Faye also had her own dream of painting full time and the surrounding land and forest would be ideal. So here we are on our way to the Lake District to start a dream life, our dream life. Unfortunately, it was the opposite. Our dreams soon turned to a nightmare we couldn't escape. Faye eventually fell asleep after leaving London, as she was up most of the night before, organizing our trip and reorganizing. Yeah, she is a little bit obsessive with organization. <laughs> plus a general lack of sleep in recent weeks due to a reoccurring nightmare. We choked how it must be an omen. <laughs> I wish I'd taken it more seriously, to be honest. I don't know if they had any link, but looking back now, uh, I don't know. We arrived at the private dirt road that led through the forest and up to our home. Faye had been Googling local parks and activities and was absolutely bursting with excitement that the surrounding forest was one of the last ancient untouched forests in England. There was an abundance of wildlife, some unseen by many, and on the endangered species list. We arrived just after 6pm as the twilight hour was drawing to a close, and pitch black night was consuming all around us. Shadows danced through the tree line either side of the truck as we bounced and rocked over the old dirt road, literally potholes and rocks everywhere. Thank God! I had the truck, I thought, as we made our way up towards the cabin. Oh, wow, said Faye. What? I asked. It says here that the old mine and quarry uncovered some ancient burial chambers and graves. Oh, spooks, I added. Yeah, definitely. Maybe I should do an EVP session, she asked. Mm-hmm, I retorted, as I wasn't really into all of that paranormal business. Damn that Zack Baggins and his immaculate hair. <laughs> if it's really good, I can send it to Zack and the crew, she added. You see? Oh. Anyway, we finally pulled up to our beautiful cabin. It was now pitch black. The sky, a majestic blanket of stars and wisps of clouds passing slowly overhead. The air was cool and had hints of the surrounding forest carried a pleasant scent in the air. We're home, said Faye. Smiling from ear to ear. We sure are, baby, I replied. Taking a second to scan the surrounding forest and views over the quarry, the moonlight and the stars twinkling on the water below. Ah, oh, it's beautiful, I said, looking over to Faye. But she was poking around over by the steps up to the porch of the cabin. What is it, baby? I asked. You better come and look for yourself, she said with a wobble in her tone. As soon as I made my way closer, the smell hit me. Oh, God! I said, trying to not throw up my recently ate McDonald's. It was a full-grown stag. Well, what was left of it? Its body was mangled and torn, deep scratches into the front shoulder that ran 
all the way down to its hind quarter. But worst of all, its legs. Each leg was broken outwards. For what I can only assume to cause as much pain and terror as possible before the final blow. Its throat is ripped out, right Dan? said Fay, now a little bit of a shade of grey and white. What could have done this? she asked. I didn't really know what to say, to be honest. I was shocked as her. It's probably a local dog or dogs from one of the farms down the road, I answered, trying to sound reassuring, but my mind was blank, and it was getting late. I will get rid of it, honey. You go on inside and have a bath. I'll be in it shortly, I offered, her face still staring at the destroyed throat. Honey, I again asked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, sorry, baby. I guess I'm beat after all this travelling she answered, still focused on the dead animal's wounds. As she walked up the steps to the front door, she turned to look at me, an unsure look painted across her expression. I'm fine, I shouted over, smiling like an idiot. She nodded and walked inside. As she did so, she turned the lights on in the cabin, lighting up the nearby tree line and road behind me. I caught a glimpse of something disappear into the forest below. It was large, that is for sure. But what creeped me out is it moved in silence, and it also was clearly trying to hide itself from us. At the time I assumed it was just a scavenging animal, but nevertheless a chill ran up my spine. The air seemed electric, and a strange sense of fear suddenly washed over me. Crack! A huge noise boomed from the forest below the cabin, followed by more. Crack! Smash! Whatever was moving down there was moving incredibly fast and sounded extremely large and moving towards the quarry. Just then, as I stood perplexed holding this mangled stag carcass like some lunatic murderer trying to drag his victim's body into a shallow grave, a enormous and deep howling or screaming erupted from the forest and it wasn't alone. Another soon followed from my left towards the dirt road that we had just driven down and it was close. I dropped the stag and ran up to the steps of my deck in the front door. I could hear something with wheezing breath and heavy footfall thumping its way across the gravel behind me. Sheer panic raced through my veins. As I made it to the full security of the front door, I turned only to see the back end of the stag being dragged quickly into the tree line, the branches five feet above it swaying as if something had just pushed its way through them. I gasped as another deep howl erupted from the forest below, sending flocks of birds flying into the night sky. And then, silence fell all around. I was still standing at the door, when face swung open the door behind me, causing me to jump out of my skin, and I squealed a note I didn't even think was possible for a man to do. <laughs> oh, did I scare you? Faye grinned. I was still panting from the run and panic. I managed to blurt out, <laughs> yeah, fake laugh, but she could see me trembling and my face apparently was as white as a sheet of paper. <laughs> yeah, 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 you got me, honey, I said, trying to recover my masculinity. Did you hear that? I asked, looking more than puzzled. No, what? Faye answered. I noticed then that she had her Beats earphones around her neck. Not wanting to panic her, I lied and said, oh, just some horrible fox making a racket out there, forcing a crooked smile upon my face. One last glance at the tree line and dirt road, but it was like nothing had happened at all. I shut the door and we had dinner, enjoying a bottle or two of red wine cuddled up around our new log fire. We watched the flames dance and flicker, and whatever was outside, it could wait until the morning. I have to say, sleep was sparse that night for both of us, me dreaming of being dragged into the forest just like the stag, and Faye with her reoccurring nightmares. But we were excited to start the first day to our new life. Faye wanted to go explore the surrounding forest and find a nice spot to have a picnic. I wanted to check out the quarry, but after last night, neither really excited me. So we chose a little hike south, out to a perfect spot to have lunch. It's beautiful, said Faye as we walked a game trail, a short distance from the cabin. It sure is. The beautiful deep rich green leaves and the ancient oak trees danced in a breeze as sunlight rays spun and glistened through the canopy above. It's a bit 
quiet, don't you think? I said. Yeah, I was just thinking that a while back, said Faye. We paid no mind to the eerily quiet forest. In the UK, we don't have big game predators, so a quiet forest really doesn't raise any alarm. We hiked for a solid two hours before we came to a small river and the clearing. I think we found our spot, said Faye, smiling and taking in the picturesque surroundings. Just us and the quiet babble of the river. Admittedly, it was incredibly beautiful as we sat, ate and watched a few dragonflies zip and zoom over the water to nature's melody. And even after the night before, my mind started to relax and we enjoyed lunch before packing up and heading back the way we had came. About 20 minutes into the hike back on the game trail, we noticed a set of what looked to be large, very large, strange, almost canine-like prints that crossed on and then off the trail and heading in the direction we had just taken. Wow, that must be a huge fox or dog out here, said Faye examining the prints. They have to be all of five or six inches wide and eight to nine long. I don't think it was a dog, honey. Honestly, I've never seen anything like this. I replied, trying not to panic her or myself. It was now pretty obvious to me, though. We weren't alone right now. Something had been following us. Something heavy, unknown at least to my knowledge. Oh, and did I mention they were huge, with what looked to be very formidable claws or nails. Uh, all right, let's, let's get going, eh? I suggested, almost picking her up from the forest floor and marching her away towards home, all the while glancing over my shoulder. Left, then right. Still, the forest was silent. It was getting to be around 3pm now, and in an hour or so nightfall would be upon us. I sure as hell didn't want to be in the forest when it got dark, especially not with whatever the hell was out here with us. As we got closer to home, the trowel had been obstructed here and there by small trees and branches. We were a little puzzled, to say the least. Hoo -hoo! Maybe we got squatches out here, Faye joked. I nodded, still keeping a watchful eye on our six. It was a pain in the ass, but we eventually made it back to the cabin around 4.45pm, and we got washed up and ready for dinner. I'm going to call my mum, said Faye. I started to get dinner ready whilst she was on the phone, and turned to see her watching the BBC News while talking to her mother. It was a guy out in the middle of nowhere being blasted by rain and wind, desperately trying to relay the events surrounding a group of missing students, about ten miles away from ourselves. Officials say there is no reason to suspect foul play, although events surrounding the group's disappearance raises many questions for local authorities. David Randall of National Search and Rescue said this, We are going to do all we can in finding this group of young individuals. We have ground teams in the area as we speak, and air support is on its way now. It is essential we find them in the next 24 hours as the weather conditions are set to get a lot, lot worse. Without shelter, they will surely perish and the weather may cause us to pull out of the area until it clears up. Just then, Faye glanced at me looking dumbfounded. What's wrong? I asked. The phone line just cut out, Faye replied. Try it again, I said. I did, Dan. Nothing throwing her hands either side with a puzzled expression. It was probably the weather that's moving in. I'll call someone out in the morning, honey, I replied. Again, that chill ran up and down my spine, and the hairs on my arms stood up. Whatever was going on, it didn't feel good. Something was gnawing at the pit of my stomach. We put it to the back of our minds and settled down for dinner again. It was eerily quiet night, and the following day held that same eerie, stagnant ambience. The sky was a bleak grey and mauve as the trees rustled and creaked as the new stormy weather blew in. We decided to stay in for the day, and I had called out a repairman to sort out the phone line. He was eventually two and a half hours late, arriving around 2 or 3 p.m., as he couldn't find the turn-off. Then his truck got stuck in the mud. Yep, I had to go down and pull him out. I have to say, I wasn't at all happy about having to sit there strapping the chains on his truck the whole time. It was strange. It was like I could feel something was watching us. Well, it turned out I wasn't the only one. The repair guy was acting strange also. 
I noticed he kept glancing over his shoulder and over mine. He asked me how long we had lived there, and every time he asked, his gaze was piercing. Every answer I gave, he paused, keeping that long eye-to-eye -eye glare. It gave me the creeps no end. As soon as he was free, I left to head home, and before I did, as I walked to my truck, he called out to me. Hey! You better stay out of these woods after dark. A lot of missing hikers all over this valley. There is things here that shouldn't exist. Things beyond reason and mercy. He said with his index finger waving at me like a madman. His eyes crazed. I didn't know how to respond. For a second, we just stared, eyes locked. I was about to go back over and ask him what the hell he was referring to when Faye called. I gestured with my hands either side and said, I'll be back in a bit. I needed to ask him some questions. He nodded and he tipped his hard hat at me. Hey, what's up? I answered. Hey, I need you to come back and hang this door for me, Faye asked. Sure, baby, I'll be up in two minutes. I hung up and got back in my truck and made my way back up the dirt road back home. As I was driving away, I glanced in the rearview mirror. The guy was just standing there watching me drive away. Okay, I thought. Something is not right here. What on earth was he talking about? I mean, yeah, people go missing all the time, especially out here in the country. And then, of course, that feeling in the pit of my stomach arose again, like a foreboding twist in my intestine. Was he talking about whatever was making all that noise at night and in the forest the day before? I arrived home as the weather was getting worse. In the distance, I could see the storm front rolling in over the land to the valley below. Little flashes here and there of lightning way off in the distance danced in the clouds. He'd better hurry his ass up before this wind and rain picks up, I thought to myself. Surprisingly, the storm managed to hold off longer than expected, but... We didn't hear anything from the repairman for a couple of hours. As much as I didn't want to, I knew I had to go speak with him about whatever he was talking about. I needed some answers for the weird things that had taken place since we arrived. Faye kind of seemed to pick up on my vibe and asked how long did I think he was going to be. I chuckled. <laughs> I said I had no clue, especially in this weather. Oh, okay. <laughs> she laughed. I smiled back, but I knew I had to go, and it was around 6pm and wasn't getting any earlier. I'm going to go check on him, see if he's got stuck again. Okay, baby, Faye replied. I grabbed my flashlights, raincoats and cigarettes, and headed out to the door, glancing back to see Faye all happy cuddled up and watching her favourite programme on TV, with a smile on her face. I closed and locked the door got in my truck and made my way down to see what was up. By now, it was pitch dark out. The wind was heavy, and I could hear it whistle through the nooks and crannies of my truck. Rain began to blow all across my windshield and windows, making my vision ahead a task in itself. Anyway, a couple of minutes down the now liquefied dirt road, again, thank you Land Rover, I could finally see his truck, right where it had been before. Although now, it was across the road at a 35 degree angle, lights on, and as I would eventually find out, engine running. Almost like he had attempted a U-turn, or a U-E as you guys might call it. My brow frowned at the sight, and my hands grew sweaty on the steering wheel. I pulled up just short of his truck, the rain coming down in sheets, my truck windows already steamed up with condensation. Where was he? I thought, where the bloody hell is he? As much as every fibre of my being screamed at me to get out of there now, my stomach in knots, I stepped out onto the muddy road and began walking around to the truck, clicking my flashlight on as I did so. It was torrential, the rain beating off my face and that same distinct rotting smell lingered in the air. I slowly looked around but couldn't see him or hear him anywhere. Hello? I shouted. Nothing. Again I tried. Hello? 
Nothing. I finally made it around to his truck to his driver's side door, which was wide open. As I did so, I thought I heard a man's yell, but it was quick and very faint from a distance into the forest. I couldn't make it out. I focused my attention back to his door, and that's when. That's when I see it. Blood. Not a lot of blood, but definitely enough to cause concern for the man's well-being. It was over the floor pan of the truck and his seat. I glanced down for a second and my heart dropped out of my ass. What the fuck? Right where I stood, there was a distinct drag mark in the mud, plus two distinct hand marks clearly digging at the mud as it, he, whatever was dragged away. I followed the trail marks with my flashlight and they led to the nearby tree line. What the fuck? What the fuck? My breathing and my heart pounding in my ear. The rain, my breathing and my heart was all I could hear. As I scanned the tree line once more, I caught a glimpse of what I can only describe as a purebred killing machine. I dropped the flashlight in response and fell back on my ass. Whoa, shit! I screamed, picking the light back up and looking again. It was gone. Did I really just see that? My mind seemed to jump to overdrive as a million thoughts ran through my mind at once, scrambling to my feet and falling over again in the mud. I got back up and raced to get back to my truck, slipping and sliding as I ran like I never had before in my life. I nearly ended up going under my truck rather than to the door as I flew to get into the full security of it. Finally, I scrambled and jumped in, locking the door behind me. Still, his truck sat there, lights on glaring into the tree line on the opposite side of the road. What the hell was that thing? I said aloud to myself, looking around and out of my truck windows. Nothing but pitch black, swaying forest looked back at me. Where was he? What do I tell Faye? Oh, fuck! Just then, something rocked the truck from the back end. With a dull but heavy thud. I gasped out loud and then cursed at myself for doing so. Reaching under my seat, I grabbed my only form of protection. My hatchet from B&Q's. Oh, for fuck's sake, yeah. I didn't know it yet, but I might as well have had a banana for all the damage my hatchet would do to this creature of pure violence and malice. Looking around, I couldn't see anything at all. And then it came again. I managed to see in my wing mirror a huge dark figure moving quickly into the tree line, but I couldn't really make out any details. It was too fast and dark out, and then my chest rumbled. Slightly at first, and then I heard it, a low, aggressive growling that resonated in my lungs and liver. My soul felt it. It was that deep. With this, I had had enough and started my truck to life, flooring the gas pedal, wheels spinning in the mud and clay, I whipped her round 180 degrees as fast as I could without wrecking her into the damn trees and drove like I just stole it back to the cabin. Looking at my mirror, I could see something now huge burst out of the tree line, brush and branches flying through the air as it did so. It landed on the road and began chasing me. Oh shit! I screamed, flooring it even harder, pushing my truck to its limits. In these conditions, the engine roared as it fought the harsh and dangerous terrain of the dirt road. Glancing back, it was gaining on me, and it was on two feet. I was screaming the whole time, come on, come on, come on, come on. I was finally approaching the turn up to my cabin driveway, and then my heart stopped beating. As I realised, what the hell was I going to do now? I can't just lead that, it, whatever it was. I can't just lead it to our home, to Faye. I decided to drive straight past and deeper into the forest and up this winding dirt road. To where? I had no idea, but anywhere was better than near Fay right now. The road wound and went on for quite some time and was getting worse and worse the further I went with trees and brush all over it. Eventually, I was forced to stop as a mighty old oak tree laying across the road ahead. My heart literally leapt out of my mouth as I see it come into view. I'd only just seen the creature or whatever still chasing me a turn or two back. I threw the truck into reverse and floored it. The engine roared as I sped blindly back the way I'd came. 
Then, I hit the handbrake and locked the steering wheel full turn and managed to spin the truck round again, just in time to see it coming around the last bend in the road. My headlights lighting up the mighty creature and surrounding dark forest and tree lines. It was no more than 30 metres away from me and seemingly coming straight for me like it had to the repair guy. This creature, this thing, this monster was easily eight to nine feet tall with a massive barrel chest. It must have easily weighed in the region of four or five hundred pounds. Its eyes glowed back at me, an amber to reddish colour. The fur or hair glistened in the glow of my truck lights. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It threw its enormous long arms open to each side and let out an enormous deep howl. As it did so, I noticed it had hands. It had hands like an ape or human. It wiggled each long finger as it splayed its hands open. I could see hot breath bellowing from its mouth as it edged ever closer. Its canines glistened in the light of my truck and I was frozen, my mind a complete blank. And then it hit me. Werewolf. The now familiar stench of decay and damp, whatever, was filling the small space of the inside of my truck. It let out another almighty growl and then slapping its long arms down to the earth, causing water from a huge puddle to splash up. I jumped at the sight. It was now right in front of me, less than 10 metres away, when it stopped and began moving around my truck. Finally, towards the passenger side of the truck, it snarled and made a terrifying snapping sound came from its maw as it began circling my truck once more the other way, almost like it was enjoying me panicking. I could hear its heavy breathing as it sniffed up and down my passenger door. It suddenly stopped and then slowly, looking up, it glanced a furious look in its eyes, a feeling of guilt washed over me and I couldn't maintain eye contact. It smacked the door, bang, bang. Then it again started to walk on two legs round the front of my truck towards my side. As it did, it dragged its long and seemingly sharp black claws over the hood of my truck. A sly and sinister grin painted across its face. Ah, oh, hell no, I said. I waited no longer and dropped the truck into gear, flooring it for my life. The creature tried to grab at the truck as I flew past it, its long black claws scraping and gouging into the body of my Land Rover with a squealing, tearing noise that made my teeth hurt. I watched in my mirror as it just stood there, eyeing me as I desperately tried to escape. Then I watched as I rounded the bend. It took two huge strides into the opposite tree line and was gone. By now, I was shaken profusely and could hardly catch my breath as my body went into shock. I raced back home and flew through the cabin door, locking it like a crazy person before collapsing on the floor. Faye came rushing downstairs at the sight of me. What's wrong, honey? What's wrong? She asked. I tried to speak, but I found no words would come out. Dan, you're scaring me. What? What happened? You've been gone for hours. She again asked, grabbing me by the head, looking into my eyes. I knew that she saw the terror right then and there. He, 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 he was gone. I trailed off again. Gone? She asked. Who? What do you mean gone? Faye again shaking me, trying to get some sort of explanation. The, re re the repair, the repair guy's gone. I blurted out in a hurried and wobbling tone. His truck is... It's down the road, but, but, but what, Dan? God damn it, what? Asked Faye, now looking more concerned. He's missing. I found blood. Oh God, Faye, I said, looking her in the eyes. Her face a beautiful, puzzled expression. Something is out there. It's huge. It got him and, oh God, oh God. It what? She persisted. It dragged him. It dragged him, Faye, out of his truck and into the forest. I finally managed to get out, as my eyes as wide as a crazy person jacked up on crack. What? I, I don't understand, Dan, she responded. Quick, just 
Help me lock all the doors and the windows. Pull the curtains now. I said, starting to regain my surroundings and composure. Okay, whatever you want, honey. She said as we both raced around the cabin, checking windows and doors, before finally we sat and settled down in bed. <laughs> Why, I have no idea. It's not like we were catching any sleep that night. It was a quiet night with nothing but the storm blowing outside and the rain beating off the glass windows. I lay in bed listening for anything at all, whilst watching my beautiful wife sleep and breathe ever so softly. I had to protect her, no matter what, but how? I didn't stand a chance against whatever that was. Were the legends true? Did werewolves really exist? Around 4am, I heard it again, off in the distance towards the quarry, I think. It was faint, but there was no mistake in that long and deep howling. Then, nothing. Just the wind and rain. Chapter 2 in the series entitled The Winlatta Forest Secrets The next few hours as I lay there waiting for the sun to come up and break the silence were almost a blur until my alarm clock went off at 7am. I had been staring out the window at the treetops swaying in the wind. Beams of sunlight again moved and danced through them as the sun came up. I had to notify the police. Someone. Oh no. What are they going to find? What do they think I did it? I thought to myself. My breath seemingly out of reach as panic washed over me. I have to call them. I muttered aloud. Waking Faye as I did so. What? What time? What time is it, Dan? She said as she stroked a long lock of her brunette hair away from her brow. For a moment, I swear, everything seemed okay. <laughs> anyway, I had called the local authorities and two units were sent up to us. Faye was confused, but as worried as I, because she knew something serious had happened. It was written all over my face. She kept asking me for more details and I had to ask her to just stop. Just wait until the police had been. Just know that by no means does she go outside until we know more. Yes, it sounded crazy, I know. But for all the years we'd been together, she knew I was acting like this for a good reason. When they have left, then I will tell you more, I promise. But for now, baby, please, believe me. There is some kind of... The words desperately trying to come to mind. Bear! Faye replied excitedly, but still concerned. No! No, not a bear. I, I don't know. Dan, will you just say it? She demanded, frustrated with the lack of answer that I had already given. It just looked like a damn... A damn werewolf. Okay? A werewolf. I blurted out hurriedly. It was huge. And it just looked... Like a werewolf, goddamn. A cold sweat started to appear across my forehead. A werewolf. Really, Dan? I suppose now you believe in Bigfoot, finally. She laughed. My face stayed its same course of stone-cold serious. She nervously giggled and smiled while looking me in the eyes. My God, you really mean it. But I... Are you sure? It was all Faye could manage before there was a knock at the door. All I could do was nod and look back in the eyes of my wife as if my own soul was trying to convince her how serious I was, how serious this was. I answered the door to two men wearing almost identical suits and sunglasses. They quickly flashed their badges and made their way inside, pushing straight past me. And as I made an attempt to protest, I was soon tased. I awoke some time later, slumped in my recliner, with a pan from the kitchen being emptied over my head. <laughs> Who the hell are you? I screamed as consciousness pulled me back to the situation. What do you want? I said, hoping to get some response. My wife sat next to me with her hands the same as mine, tied to the chair that of a guy close by. Both men simply just stared at us. Then the taller one spoke. It appears you, are, or rather we, have a problem with some of the local wildlife. The taller man of the two almost asked smugly. How much have you seen? What have you heard? 
he said as he slowly crouched down in front of Fay. I screamed through the gag of my mouth. Fay almost having a panic attack. He then jumped over to me. You're the one who has seen him, ain't you? He said as he leaned right up in my nose, face to face. God, his breath stunk like arse and coffee. Yeah, I've seen him something. But I don't know what it was. I glared back at him. And what about the old man? The engineer? What did he tell you? He asked this while smacking me across the collarbone. The pain was intense and I could hear Faye screaming as he then grabbed my head with both of his hands. Smack! He sucker punched me in the chest and brought his steel toe cap down after it with a crunch, winding me of any breath. Now, you have exactly two minutes to get your shit together and tell me what they told you and what you've seen. He screamed at both of us. Okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> I tell you, you fucking piece of shit. I said, spitting up some blood and gasping for air in my now very sore chest. Of course you fucking will. <laughs> he remarked, so cock sure of himself. I think there's a bear or something out there in the forest. I again gasped and wheezed for breath. Oh no. You know we're not here to fuck around, Danny boy, eh? He gestured with his bear like fist clenched and his chubby index finger pointing at me. What about the other animals, Danny? No? Nothing mentioned by the old boy. Again, he kicked me and face screamed at him to leave me alone. <coughs> right, all right, I said, coughing and spluttering. There was something odd about the old boy. He, he kept staring into the forest around our trucks as we spoke. And he warned me to never go in the forest after dark. That was it. He never said why. Just never to go in after dark. I said, look him, this piece of shit in the eyes. He never got to tell me what the hell was going on here. Whatever was out there got to him before I could return or before he could come back up to the property when he was finished. Again, the other guy next to Faye did nothing but stand and stare at me. And then Faye. And then me again. Well, the taller one declared. Here's the thing. You're not supposed to be here. And neither are they. He said with a chuckle in his voice, the old man was eldest to a local farming family who, well, have been working these lands around the valleys for hundreds of years, generations of generations. You get the fucking picture. He continued. The warning he'd given you was served with genuine message. You really don't want to be in those woods after dark, Danny boy. In fact, if I was you, and you're pretty sort of a wife. I'd get the hell away from here as soon as possible. He declared, but almost with a tone of, we don't have a choice. Oh, oh, he asked. I almost forgot to mention. <laughs> Do not mention any of this to anyone. As of now, you're both under our surveillance. What? I said, pissed to the point of my blood boiling. You still haven't told us who we work for. That is information you do not need to know, and will never need to know, Danny boy. Just think of us as garden angels. <laughs> We're part of the clean-up crew. Who, well, he paused. Clean up. <laughs> Again, with that maniac-like laughter. It's up to you to stay, or not. But I do think it's best you make a move ASAP. It's almost a full moon. <laughs> So the werewolves, I shouted. He's a clever one, this one, ain't he, John? He declared almost again smugly to himself and his partner. No, you damn boy. Not werewolves. Something altogether far worse. They have been here forever. The local people know where to stay and where not to stay. They have an almost understanding with some of these creatures. But believe me, boy, there are things in this valley and forest that will skin you alive whilst watching you in the eyes just for pleasure. He screamed as he again came in close to my face with his disgusting breath, rancid and hot. Remember, not a word. Well, your pretty wife here might have to go meet their alpha male. And with that, they cut the ropes off us and walked casually towards the door. 
But what about the... I said, but was cut off. The police have been handled. The old boy had an accident while working on the phone line. Remember, not a word. He said again before turning out the front door and closing it quietly. We sat there, stunned. Faye began crying and I rushed over to comfort her and tell her everything was going to be okay. What do we do, Dan? She cried. We can leave right now, honey. It's fine, I replied. Well, where would we go? All our money's in this. We can't just leave. She sobbed. I know, but we... I didn't know for the first time in longer than I could remember. I didn't have an answer. That day was spent with me making reinforcements to the cabin and trying to make a couple of spears. I must have looked ridiculous. Had we not lived in such a remote location, I surely would have ended up on YouTube or something. <laughs> in my head, I had watched Bear Grylls survival shows, so I had some idea of what I was doing. Well, that's what I thought anyway. Faye jumped straight on the internet and started researching anything remotely relatable. Lichens, werewolves, wolfmen. Until finally, as it was getting late afternoon, she called me over. Hey, come check this out. I rushed over and sat down with her while sipping a piping hot cup of coffee. She began to explain how through her Bigfoot research community, there was a word and reports of such werewolf looking creatures. And they were named collectively by the term Dogman. I could not believe what I was seeing. These are all the reports in the USA, Dan, she said. So far, there was a number of these things all over the USA. I haven't checked yet for England, but I'm guessing they are. As she then brought up a witness picture description of a beast of Bray Road. It was close, but not quite right. How about this one? she asked. She showed me another witness description and the hairs all over my body stood on end. That's it! That's what I saw! I said aloud. This is a dogman report from Ohio, Dan. Why the hell? No. How the hell are these things here? She said, almost crying again. I heard about them last year, but... But I just dismissed the idea. Again, tears welled in her eyes. Hey, I said, handing her my jumper to wipe her tears away with. We boarded up pretty tight in here. I think we'll be okay. I said, trying to sound supportive. Again, unsure of what I was saying, I had no clue if we would survive the next few hours, let alone... The entire night. Okay, Faye replied, smiling to me. As evening approached and the sky over the quarry dimmed to a watercolour blend of orange and blues with crimson notes far off, it was suddenly abruptly smashed by the deep, revolving rotor sound of inbound helicopters overhead and over towards the forest and, and quarry's outer areas. What the hell? We both said as the two Apache helicopters flew low to the forest canopy and swept across the valley and surrounding forest. The noise was tremendous. They swooped down over the cliff face and began, I can only guess, searching. Searching for them. Just then all hell broke loose as the two helicopters engaged with something on the ground and roars far off in the distance could be heard above the damn helicopter blades and relentless bursts of gunfire. And then I imagine a number of targets as they battled on into the night for hours and hours. We both hurried to the bed with some provisions and our laptops. I grabbed my mate do spears and grabbed the two biggest kitchen knives I could find. Thankfully, one of them a huge meat cleaver given to me by my old grandfather, who used to be a butcher in London. What better way than my own grandfather's blade to wield as a weapon, I thought to myself. Around 2am, there was a loud crashing sound and something made its way through the trees and brush towards the cabin. We both sat up and looked at each other. What is that? Faye whispered. It must be one of them. I replied, whispering also, trying to not draw attention. I got up and slowly made my way to the window, peeking out through the crack in the boards that I'd placed on the outside. This is crazy, I whispered to myself as I looked. We could hear it drawing closer and closer. Its breathing then audible in the night ambience. The gunfire had ceased for the moment. Then it passed through the tree line out into the open. By now, Faye had joined me at my side, arms around me, peering through a crack in the boards. 
Oh my god! She whispered, voice trembling, and I felt her knees give a little at the sight of this creature. Although it resembled a werewolf, this was no movie. This dogman was a real life creature of God's creation, or possibly a creature of the devil himself. It awkwardly loped its way out and across the drive until dead centre with our cabin. It had clearly been injured as the both of us could make out blood and tissue loose and maimed on its skin, its right arm seemingly broken and hanging awkwardly to the wrong side. It paused in its journey across and turned to glance up at us. I swear, it knew we were looking at it. The strangest thing then again happened. As we looked upon this beast, a purebred force in fear and violence, it was like it speaking to me directly to my mind. As I could, could not maintain eye contact or whatever. I don't know, it was just strange. Face said she felt the exact same feeling. It made its way over towards the steps and again stopped, sniffing the air with huge, long snorts, and then continued to walk up onto our decking. What the fuck do we do, Dan? Faye whispered to me. We sit tight, stay still and quiet, okay? I replied, hoping she had enough strength to see this through for the both of our sakes. The heavy and lengthy strides took each step of its clawed feet, came down with a booming thud. We cuddled up in bed watching and waiting, listening as it continued to circle the property. We could hear it trying to handle to the doors, and then came from the windows as its long black claws reaching through the boards to tap on the glass on the other side. It continued again and we sat silent, watching and waiting for the sun to rise, or this thing, this monster, to burst its way in, whichever came first. Gradually, it appeared to get bored as it continued to circle the property, regularly scratching and sniffing loudly. And then there was an almighty howl that seemed to stop this dogman in its tracks. It turned and bound away on all fours into the forest and finally was gone. At last, we sighed a huge sigh of relief. But for how long is all we could think and feel? There were no more visits from the two ghost agents and gradually things returned to a sort of normal. Do you think they'll ever return, Dan? Faye asked with hope in her beautiful eyes. I don't know, baby. I really don't know. It's been a month since that night. I replied trying to sound positive and excited to start living our dreams. Three months later went by, and still there was no sightings, or sounds. But still that screaming silent ambience hung around the property and surrounding land. I'm going to meet with the builders next week down at the quarry, baby, and get things started with the fish farm and camping areas. I said excited to finally get things in motion, all the while the thought of the whereabouts of those creatures nagging at my conscious like a bug or insect gnawing and scuttling around in the back of my mind. Are you sure? Faye responded, looking shocked at the notion. I think so. I mean, we've got to start making some money before the year is out, or we're going to be in trouble. But what if they come back? She responded, looking more than a shade of white. Uh, I know. I I've contacted Jimmy from Bethnal Green. You remember Jimmy, right? I said, kind of hoping that she didn't, as Jimmy was the sort of guy who caused a fair deal of mayhem wherever he seemed to go. Oh, Dan, you can't be serious. Jimmy, the guy's a freaking lunatic, she said as she glared back at me. Yeah. Precisely the type of guy we might need around here if those things come back. Plus, he can get hold of a couple of shooters for a good price. I replied hoping she would ignore the obvious headache that Jimmy was so fondly known to cause. You are fucking kidding me, Dan. What the hell do you know about guns? She declared, angrily shouting at me in frustration at my suggestions. Look, I know it's not ideal, baby, but I don't think we have a choice. We need something to protect ourselves from them. Do you have any better ideas, Faye? I barked back. But all it did was cause a stagnant rift to well up from our nightmares and worries. I left and headed out the door down towards the quarry, with my truck slamming the front door as I left. 
What the hell are you doing, Dan? I muttered to myself as I climbed into the truck and made my way down the bumpy and overgrown dirt road that had once led to the edge of the quarry site. I pray to God Jimmy can get hold of something serious, because I'm all out of ideas. I said to myself once more before finally pulling up just outside the quarry. The sun was beautiful and a warm breeze carried through the long, overgrown grass and trees. This could be perfect, I thought. Yeah, perfect dream. Or perfect nightmare. Chapter 3 in my series entitled The Winlatter Forest Secrets Soon the builders had been gone, clearing back the surrounding brush and trees and any rock outcrops to make enough room around the lake for some camping areas and eventually a number of cabins. It was all coming together nicely and Faye and I decided to also have a zipline obstacle course installed in a nearby forest adjacent to the lake. It would yield a return profit much quicker than a fishing lake. Plus, we could employ someone to run things whilst living in one of the cabins, as the arrangement before we could afford to pay them the full salary. Everything was coming together stage by stage, and after a few more months, things were starting to feel like normal again, since we hadn't really any sign of the creatures near our property or land. Also, some wildlife had moved back into the area again, and we would sometimes be lucky enough to catch a deer or a stag crossing the driveway as we sat out on the decking. Faye would spend hours painting the horizon and enjoyed every sunset that cloaked the horizon at each day's end. Our suspicions were now and then triggered as the news would indeed report another missing person or persons. Usually it was someone old or a group of young hikers. Each time the events surrounding their demise a resounding oddity compared to the most reports covering missing people. An item of clothing or boots would be all that could be traced. Sometimes a body would be recovered in a source of shallow water, completely naked and miles from their believed location of disappearance. To any apparent investigation being conducted that was, but the worst and biggest trigger for our concerns were the ones they didn't find. Or worse still, the ones they did, but they were either missing the head or the heads were broken by brute force backwards to face the wrong direction. Of course, authorities would presume the injury happened due to a terrible accident, simply caused by a fall, etc. But if one was to dig further into the location that the bodies were recovered, they would soon discover there were no points of elevation nearby, i.e. they didn't fall from a cliff or high bank of land. As I said though, although rare, these reports on the news sent cold shivers down my spine and that feeling in the pit of my stomach would turn and gnaw away. Most reports would be around the 10 mile radius mark but some did fall within 5 or less radius of our cabin. Too close for mine or Faye's liking, that was for sure. Faye tended to try and ignore the reports but continued to study on the subject of upright canids. The more we learnt, the less we felt comfortable but still things moved along nicely. Jimmy soon arrived about two weeks after I told Faye he was coming. Man, <laughs> she wasn't pleased one bit. Said he was a crook and couldn't be trusted, but I had known Jimmy since I was in primary school. Yeah, he was a little rough around the edges, but you could rely on him if the shit hit the fan. His time spent away with the Marines in the Gaza Strip in Afghanistan had only really pickled his swede, sorry, his mind. He returned a different, more colder Jimmy, was in trouble with the police on more than one occasion for violence or drinking related offences. Eventually, we drifted apart as I settled down with Faye, but we did always remain in touch and close friends at that. We put Jimmy up in one of the first cabins we had available, but for the first two months, he was living in a caravan trailer down near the lake. It was convenient to say the least, as he could keep an eye on the equipment and things down at the lake and campground. At first, things were pretty good. I felt a little more confident with Jimmy around, plus with him keeping an eye on the building work, etc. Faye and I had some more time together to explore some of the nearby land and possible cave that Faye had read was thought to be an old burial site for ancient Anglo-Saxon ancestors. 
We left Jimmy around 12 o'clock lunchtime and headed out across the fields and woods. It was around two or three miles down the road from our property. And in fact, his farmhouse sat almost in line with our cabin. We stopped and gave the usual cliche greetings. And at first he was charming, polite. I think he thought that we were just sightseeing tourists. But as soon as I mentioned that we lived just up the road on the other side of the forest, his entire demeanour, attitude and aura changed like the flip of a coin. What's wrong? asked Faye inquisitively. The farmer looked at me and then down to the ground, kicking a small pebble with his boot. If this is because of those things in that forest, it's okay, we know about them too. I said, hoping to gain a small limit of trust from him. He removed his dusty and worn out cap from his head and he wiped sweat away from his brow. You haven't seen nothing, he barked back. All you've seen is the offspring, his pups, you fools. Madness glared in his eyes. So you think you can just stick around and he won't come for you, or your wife? He again barked. What? shouted Faye, now clearly not up for any more drama. What do you mean, old man? We see that huge monster just the other night. Dan has seen many since we arrived. The old farmer shot another glance at me. No, you haven't seen him yet. Not the alpha male. He dwarfs all the others. Something of nightmares is what he is. I only ever seen him once, but huh, that was enough. Well, the one that chased me towered over the roof of my truck. I said, protesting in some strange fashion, I had indeed seen what he was talking about. Oh, really, young man? And just what colour was this creature you see? He asked, gazing me deep in their eyes. What? I responded. Colour, man, it's colour. Oh, I replied. Yes, of course. It was uh, black. It was but darker than night itself black. I've never seen anything else like it before. I replied. Hmm. The old boy chuckled slightly to himself and began shaking his head. No, Dan, no. I'm afraid you are wrong. And as yet, I believe, as yet to see him, the Alpha. How? replied Faye, looking more and more vexed by the minute with our new neighbour. Yeah, I agreed, eager to hear why he was so sure I had not encountered this Alpha male dogman. Well, one reason, Dan. He is as white as snow with little bits of black at the tips of his fur. The Alpha always takes on a white coat akin to the silverback gorilla coming of age and status within his community. But how? I stammered before being cut short by the farmer. I've lived on this land my whole life, young man. It's, or rather they, have been here longer than anyone can recall. I lose a few sheep a month or chickens and a good few dogs over the years. There's nothing you or anyone can do, son he said. And what about those government arseholes? I asked. <laughs> They're beautifully stupid. You will see them and their trucks around now and then. I honestly don't think they even know how to deal with them, let alone the Alpha, he responded. Is there anything we can do to, you know, stay safe? I asked. He nodded and replied, yeah, yeah. There's a few rules I live by, as talked to me by my father and, of course, his father before him. First, stay inside after dark at all costs. Second, don't try to interfere with them or their food. Much like a pit bull and his toy, you know. Three, respect the forest if you're ever crazy enough to go back in there. Obviously lock everything up at night so you don't have any, you know, late night visitors. They can turn a door handle, no problem. Oh, fantastic. Just bloody brilliant, Dan shouted Faye. They're going to just walk right in while we're sleeping, she added. No, baby, I won't let that happen. I responded, hoping my words would actually register some comfort. They're not all bad, you know, he remarked to us as we bickered. Sorry, what? I replied. Not all bad. The creatures. Some are different to the others. They seem more coexistent or just simply not interested. I don't know. I've had them walk right past me or come right up and sniff me before. And it felt different somehow, he added. Then other times over the years I have been chased from my truck to my front door, or well, the truck gets chased as I drive it. Yeah, I found that one out already, I remarked, a small smile hitting his square weathered jaw in response. Yeah, you ain't gonna have it easy here, 
but follow those rules and keep an eye on your surroundings at all times. You should do fine. Whatever you do, don't shoot at them. It will only piss them off and the whole pack will then turn on you. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, I asked, forgetting we hadn't even exchanged names among our small talk. Bill, Bill Dunham, the old farmer replied. Yes, thank you, Bill. Uh, well, take care now, said Faye as we all parted ways with Faye and I manoeuvring in and out of the sheep flock as they moved up the winding road. Bill tipped his dusty old cap at us and whistled for his dog to lead on. Soon, we had to leave the old worn and pothole ridden road and cross a small ditch into the forest. After what we had just heard, it was the last place I wanted us to be. But Faye was really pumped into finding the cave, maybe some sort of archaeological evidence of people once inhabiting the immediate area, possibly even as the burial ground for the villagers deceased. Do you think he's right? asked Faye as we stumbled and made our way through the thick brush, huge ferns as high as my stomach, almost to Faye's chest. It did not help my nerves as we trudged through. Way too many places for something to hide in waiting to ambush an unsuspecting city boy. Right, in what way? I replied. That some are not bad or aggressive as such. She responded with hope in a tone to her sweet voice. I don't know, babe. He certainly knew a lot about them and, well, he has lived here his whole life. Plus he's not dead yet. Faye couldn't help but laugh with me to the last comment. How much further does this map say we've got to go? I inquired. Should be around the next quarter mile within the side of that peak. Faye responded, pointing northwards towards what I could just make out as the top of the hill through the tree's canopy. Okay, I said, trying to catch my failing breath. We are pretty much within where records show the community or village that was spread out over this hillside and surrounding forest. Keep an eye out for any odd looking raised mounds of earth and stone, damn. She declared almost like a supervisor. I didn't mind. In fact, I liked it when she got bossy. A bit of a turn on. <laughs> but that's a whole different story. Soon we found a little clearing that did appear to have some signs of very old foundations to buildings. But a lot of it was guesswork for me. But Faye could see it all, as if she was right there, back in time. The excitement was a welcome break from all of the stress, to be honest. I want to push on a little further and see if we can locate the cave entrance, she said. Sure, baby, we, we got time, I think. But you don't want us to hang around now. I replied, hoping she was thinking the same as I. Of course, honey. I don't want to be here as it starts to get dark. Just a quick investigation, I promise. She added, looking excited. We cut through the thick trees and ferns for another 10 or 15 minutes until gradually the ground began to incline and then we broke through the trees and brushed to be met with the solid rock side of the hill, various wild flowers sprouting from the nooks and crannies in the hard, unforgiving rock and relentless green and brown lichen and moss. The contrast of grey and white granite rock with deep and light green and browns, and then explosions of colour with yellow, lilac, reds and whites. There was a definite hint of a close-by honeysuckle bush wafting on the cool breeze. We followed the rock face around the corner, found a small game trail that clung to the steeper parts of the incline. As we rounded another bend in the trail, we came across some animal bones scattered all over the leafy trail. We both glanced at each other nervously. Then we kept pushing on. I had then taken the lead, a few paces ahead of Faye. Soon, we found a small mouth of a cave. <laughs> it wasn't anything grand, by no means. But we could clearly see some inscriptions and drawings on the inside about 20 feet into the cave. We clambered and climbed in and down to take a closer look with our flashlights. I have to say, it was beautiful and downright incredible. These drawings were so old, yet here they were, still holding colour. It was probably made from local plants and mineral sources. The tunnel continued on further, but it was getting late in the afternoon, and we were spooked enough. The drawings seemed to depict ancient warriors in battle with what had to be the Dogman, but also it was something else. It looks almost like a Bigfoot or something, but it was apparently larger than a Dogman. It also depicted as if there was trades between some of the people and the warriors and the Dogman creatures. Possibly the humans were given a blessing or peace offering to the dogman. Either way, it was a clear profile that there had indeed been a trading community here long ago. Plus, they had lived in some sort of harmony or coexistence 
with the dogman. Nothing was concrete as such, but with what the old farmer Bill had said and what these cave drawings depicted, I was happy to conclude what the old boy had said was indeed true. There were others. Perhaps that is who stalked us in the forest on our first hike and picnic. Faye finished up taking some pictures on her camera, and as she turned to me to say something, there was a deep moaning that, that boomed and echoed from deep within the cave's belly. I looked at Faye and her and I. Let's get the hell out of here and back to the road fast, I said with a panic welling up inside my gut. Yeah, what a fantastic idea, Dan, she joked back at me, but I too could see the panic in her eyes. Another booming grunt or snort came again, and this time seemingly closer. We set about grabbing our backpacks and began hightailing it back the way we had came, desperately trying not to lose our footing on the loose, rocky dirt trowel. There was no room for a mistake. On parts, your ass was grass. It was suddenly becoming apparent that all the usual natural chorus that had accompanied us on our way in was now indeed non-existent. Plus, I soon realised we were being stalked again. Ten minutes after we exited the cave, I noticed every now and then small amounts of pebbles and dirt would come tumbling down the sheer rock face on my right. At first, I didn't think anything of it, but then it soon dawned on me that the pebbles became larger and more regular. It was now obvious someone, or rather something, was above us on the rock face and was now stalking us from above. We followed the trail back towards the tree line. I did decide not to mention it to Faye as just to keep the pace up all the while. Scanning our surroundings and now above. Please God, please let us get back to the road, I thought to myself. Just then, a huge snap rang out in the forest from behind us. I spun around quickly as possible, but there was nothing to be seen. We finally made it down to the forest tree line, and I suggested we pick up our pace through this section. It was getting to 3pm, and I felt I was late enough. What's wrong, Dan? asked Faye, clearly picking up on certain vibes from my body language and pow complexion. <laughs> oh, oh dear, nothing babe, I laughed nervously. I, I don't know Faye, but I, I think we might have been getting followed since we left the cave. I just want to get you back to the road as soon as possible. This place is beyond creeping me out now. Oh shit Dan, you think so? Faye replied looking over her shoulder as she walked forward. Again, by now, the lush green ferns were up to my stomach and practically up to face chest. Something was trailing from behind us about 40 metres or so. Every now and then I caught a glimpse of something dark, but it would move out of my line of sight every few seconds. Lord knows I didn't want to point it out to Faye. As fate would have it, I didn't have to. As we walked through the thick brush, the land seemed to naturally funnel us either side by higher points of earth each side, i.e. it was textbook ambush site and we were walking right through the goddamn middle of it. Out of nowhere, the thick green ferns parted, and in a solid second, we had walked upon a female dogman. To make matters worse, she was with pups. Oh shit, we both shouted, Faye climbing up my back in response. I nearly lost control of my bladder right there and then. And then the wind changed and the smell hit us. Oh god, she stunk of something rancid, but it seemed different. You know, just different to the encounter in my driveway that had hinted of sulphur and garbage, but this, this was more wet dog. Dead animals too. Without a second to react, the dog man, or rather dog woman in this case, springs up onto all fours and bluff charged us, only stopping inches away from my face. It was pure black. Its eyes were a deep auburn to yellow and its breath a stagnant, hot bellowing, making a slaughter of my senses. Whoa! I exclaimed aloud. Faye grabbed at my arm and sleeve. Oh God, Dan, what the hell do we do now? She shouted as it snorted and sniffed at me. It's evident that this large chest capacity blowing my hair up and back with each of its exhales. We don't move, I replied calmly as possible, given the circumstance. Its eyes looking deep into mine the whole time, it investigated me and then Faye. As it did so, one of her young little pups came bouncing over to us. Running through my legs and then phase, the mother dogman just watched calmly as it did so. Whilst this was going on, I noticed that the adult femur had some strange pattern or marking on her fur, almost like faint stripes of white, like that of a Tasmanian tiger. Also said not to exist, or at least not in modern times. 
or I suppose you could compare it slightly to the speckled pattern on its back that would be of a hyena. Yes, a hyena would be a good analogy, as its body definition was kind of like that of a hyena. Huge, huge powerful front shoulders and long oversized front legs. Although these were clearly arms with hands, they dwarfed its hind legs. Still, these were huge and muscular, but nothing compared to the arms. Don't move, I again insisted. To be honest, I really didn't have the first idea of what to do. Its head was so large that I believe it could just bite my entire head off my shoulders in one huge bite of its formidable jaws. It looked down at the young pup who by now had decided to urinate on one of my boots and attack the lace on my other boot. Slowly, the mother circled us as its young bounced around. My heartbeat was almost deafening and my ears of adrenaline pumped around my body. As it paced slowly around the both of us, frozen in our place awaiting whatever judgement it was going to cast against us before ripping my arms off and tearing my throat out. But it never did. It continued to look us up and down intently and then at its pup savaging what was now left of my boot. Okay, follow me, slowly. Remember, it's going to be watching for any fear and sudden movements. Just step back with me slowly. I asked Faye, hoping she could maintain her composure for just long enough for us to get out of there. I'm scared, Dan, Faye replied softly, a definite wobble in her voice. I know, baby, I know. Me too. But it would have killed us by now if it was going to, right? I added, as we slowly began backing away and taking a wide breath of the mother and her little pack. As we did so, she followed us with her gaze intently. It suddenly became clear the old boy was right. It was another kind, another more natural pack. For as we cut our way through the brush and trees, we could make out larger dogman probably the rest of the pack, tailing us and flanking each of our sides the entire route back to the road. Only once we came out of the deep, dark forest and fading sunlight beamed into our eyes did a pack appear to leave us. Although, I'm sure, this was not the case. That was too close, Dan, declared Faye, now looking over her shoulders as we walked the last few miles back to our cabin. Absolutely, babe. But did you see how she reacted to us? I asked almost excitedly. Yeah, it was strange. I thought for sure we were going to be torn to shreds, Faye replied. It was fast approaching 4.30pm and the sun had begun its descent into the twilight rest. The horizon again a wash of deep warm summer colours, as incredible sized flocks of starlings swooped and danced in the sky, almost hypnotising to watch thousands of tiny birds moving as one giant cloud of loud tweets and chirps. Strange compared to the dark and scary reality of the area that had just once again rocked our little world in two. A little while later we made it back just as dusk was taking hold of the forest and surrounded land. Around 7pm we invited Jimmy up to the cabin for some dinner and a few beers. Faye again not the happiest of bunnies, but I think it did help. A fraction, having another man around the house after the day's events. Jimmy, mate, I need to tell you something. It's going to sound like bullshit, or you're going to think I'm having you on, or crazy. But you need to know why I called you up here and, and asked you about the strap. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, mate. I'm all ears. I know it's got to be serious for you. You wouldn't invite me up here. It's not like Faye enjoys my company. <laughs> he laughed a hearty laugh. Faye scowled at him and then me, as if to say, Fuck the both of you pricks. I grinned in response, then added, No, Jimmy, I mean it. There is something in this forest. Hell, all over the valleys. Yeah, sheep, Dan. He added jokingly, No, Jimmy, listen to me. As soon as we arrived, things started happening. Strange things. He looked at me, confused. Well... We had a problem with the phone line, we called the guy out and next thing I know he calls me up to ask me to pull his truck out of the mud. Well, Jimmy, I got there in the pissing rain, pitch black night. Yeah, yeah, Jimmy beckoned. Well, his truck was on, light and everything. His door was wide open, Jim, and there was a trailed off again and flashbacks ran through my mind of that evening. It was what, Dan? He again became impatient at my pauses. There was loads of blood, Jimmy, all over the inside of the truck and door. Yeah, he probably just had an 
accident and, you know, cut himself. No, Jimmy. Listen to me. There was a trail of drag marks like his hands in the mud, leading all the way back to the forest. What? He added. Drag marks, Jimmy. Something attacked him and dragged him out of his truck and then slaughtered him alive in that forest right outside. Right there. I exclaimed aloud, hoping he would recognise how shook I was from that alone. What the fuck? said Jimmy, looking puzzled to say the least. There's more, I responded, whilst Faye sat with a cup of hot tea between her hands. As I tried to leave and return to the house, I was chased by this nightmare of a creature. Jimmy, it looked like a fucking werewolf man. Jimmy burst out laughing and slapping his knee with his hand. <laughs> it's all true you melt, Jimmy. Go ahead. Go take a walk now in the forest, Faye shouted at him. I glanced at her. Really, baby? Come on. Jimmy, I'm not kidding. There is even more to tell you. I'll pull the other one, Dan, mate. I'm not an idiot, you know. He responded angrily. I'm not, Jimmy. Look, I need you on this. I don't know who else would be crazy enough to stick around and help us. I said, again, hoping he would believe me. We spent the next four or so hours talking about the recent events and what the old farmer had warned us. Jimmy came around that something was going on here, but he refused to believe it was these creatures. He said the stress of the move and our finances put us under too much pressure. Eventually, it was late, and we said our good nights to Jimmy. Faye and I going to bed and Jimmy making his way back to the caravan. Do you think he will believe us? said Faye as we lay in bed. I don't think he has a choice, baby. Sooner or later, he's going to see them too. I just pray he'll be okay and keep a cool head. Not go all Rambo at the first sight of them, I replied. We kicked and turned in for the night. A loud owl could be heard whooping in the clear, crisp night. Around 4am, we got our answers, as we awoke to the loud and crazy roars of the creatures, and Jimmy letting off shots from his shotgun. Oh shit, we both said aloud. I rushed out to the door, but Faye grabbed my arm. No, Dan, no, she shouted. I've got to go, Faye, I screamed back at her, breaking free of her vice-like grip on my arm. And what the hell are you going to do when you get there, Dan? She again shouted at me. I don't know, but I've got to help him. And with that, I flew out the bedroom door and down to my truck. As I stepped out the door, the gunshots abruptly stopped. Just the wind and the rustles of the leaves. Silence was again smothering the forest. I wasted no more time and jumped in my truck and began thundering down that old, rugged dirt road towards the lake, towards Jimmy. On arrival of the last bend down to the camp area, I couldn't believe my eyes. There was carnage everywhere. I looked. Bits of rubbish and Jimmy's clothing and food strewn across the campground. But far worse was what was left of Jimmy's old beaten up caravan. It was in pieces, literally torn to an unrecognisable heap of odd boarding and panels, completely and utterly collapsed. Oh shit, Jimmy! I said aloud whilst pulling my truck around the site of full 360. I stopped the truck and sat there looking for any sign of Jimmy, my best friend of so many years. I had to get out. I had to at least look for him amongst the pile that was once his caravan. This is all my fault! I shouted while striking the steering wheel. I slowly and quietly stepped out onto the dirt. Still, there was nothing but silence and the wind. Jimmy, I whispered. Jim, Jimmy. Again, nothing. I crept closer to the mangled caravan. My heart was thumping in my chest. Jimmy, where are you? Jim boy. I whispered again, but there was no reply. I soon found his shotgun laying on the ground. And then there was a couple of boxes of ammunition. I started moving bits of the caravan out of the way until eventually I had seen Jimmy was gone. What the hell no! I shouted and decking down low to the ground as I realised my mistake could cost me my life. Oh God, oh God no, please no God, I whispered to myself. I then made my way back to my truck slowly and quietly as possible. As I entered my cabin I thought I heard a scream or yell from within the forest. Then a roar sounded with a boom across the nearby wood line. A huff jumped out of my skin and flew into my truck, starting the truck up with a roar of its engine. 
My headlights lit up the area around me, and I was met with a display that would turn the hardest of men's legs to pure jelly. A number of piercing red eyes glared back at me and my truck. Some were high up in the trees, others on the ground. Oh shit! I whispered in complete shock at the sight. I need to get the hell out of here now. I just prayed Jimmy ran somewhere safe. I hit the gas pedal and with another roar of my engine my truck lurched forward and I began tearing out of there like a crazy man. I glanced in my wing mirror to see numbers of the dogman walk out the tree line and watch me tearing back up the dirt road and out of the area. As I lost sight of the pack, a loud howling rung out, joined by multiple others. I swear, my hair stood on end as I desperately tried to escape. Chapter 4 in the series entitled The Winlatter Forest Secrets Without further ado, let's get straight into that. Whilst making my escape up the dirt road and down through the dark winding turns, thick trees and brush scraping my truck as I powered it over the rugged terrain, I could hear them. They were coming for me. I managed to get a head start, but the terrain of the road was terrible with its potholes big enough to swallow a small car whole. They were soon either side of me, smashing through the trees and brush at an alarming rate. My engine screamed as it worked flat out to evade the rocks and earth protruding out like Nemesis, trying to desperately make me the dogman's next meal. Suddenly, two large dogmen jumped out of each side of me, smashing into the side of the truck as they did so before causing me to lose control of the truck and crash through the trees down a 35 foot drop into a nearby river or creek as you might call it. Everything was spinning and a loud ringing in my ears was playing over as if on loop. It was suddenly interrupted with a huge, deep, bone rattling growl and thump. On the now upside down truck, the truck leaned and rocked as it made its way over to the front end. Its enormous weight crunching the aluminium body and a clinking sound I can only assume with its long black clawed feet. Another growl, but this time there was a hiss to accompany its terror. I was still spinning and felt my consciousness failing. Still stuck in my seat suspended precariously upside down by my seatbelt cutting into my shoulder. I was sure this was it. I looked ahead and out the, the window screen to see two huge muscled hairy legs and feet with long thick black claws make their way in front of the truck. There was a loud snarling sound and then a bark of sorts. I guess they were communicating as the one on top of the truck responded with a deep and ended with a hiss. I was frozen, completely helpless. Again my head throbbed and spun, almost at that point when I was ready to give up, let them do whatever horror and torment they had planned all this time for me. But as my consciousness finally gave way to blackness, I heard another long, extremely deep howling come from deeper in the woods. Then a second or two later there was a loud thundering that I could feel through the dirt. I felt the dogman on top of my truck jump down. Again, a deep blackness threatened to envelop me. The other dogman at the front turned to face the loud thumping noise, and within seconds the forest erupted into tremendous loud chaos of growls and snarls. What the hell was going on? I thought to myself. Without any further delay, the two dogmen that had chased and rammed my truck off the dirt road were tackled and began fighting with other dogmen. What the hell was going on? I could now see out of my passenger window they were both engaging with three other dogmen. The sight was incredible to say the least, as each monstrous dogman growled and swiped with their long claws at each other, biting and tearing as they wrestled and desperately as each tried to kill the other. The two dogmen that had chased me were very large compared to the three that mysteriously came from deeper within the forest. But the three dogmen had the agility and the strength to match them. Plus, they had one more. 
Again, my consciousness was in and out as I began desperately trying to free myself from the seatbelt. The thoughts of leaving Faye alone in the cabin, out here, with these creatures, was the only thing keeping me going. Well, that and the adrenaline pumping through my system at the sight before me. One of the dogmen grabbed its opponent and lifted it up before ramming it into a large tree with a tremendous crack, sending wood and splinters flying into the air. I managed to free myself, slumped onto the roof of my truck and began kicking my door out, desperately trying to escape these apex predators. A loud, almost war cry rang out soon, followed by a loud and wet crunch. I glanced over my shoulder to see two had now became one as a downed dogman lay mangled on the floor clearly with its back broken as the successor began to rip its throat out. Long strands of tissue and tendon being pulled and stretched, blood dripped from its maw as it basked in its whim over its foe. Suddenly without warning, as my attention was drawn to the gruesome demise of this dogman, the door was ripped open and off its hinges. A huge, hulking hairy figure crouched into the truck and reached out its long, hairy arm. Again, my consciousness failed before it grabbed at my legs and pulled. Blackness swallowed me whole as I couldn't maintain consciousness and a deep, dark silence took over. I awoke some hours later, dazed, and my head throbbed with pain. Dan! Oh, Dan! Faye screamed and shrieked at me whilst holding my head and then my hands. Where the hell have you been? She asked, her tears falling into my eyes and onto my clothes. Oh, what? I croaked and wheezed as the extent of my injuries became apparent. My chest was sore with bruising. Oh, Dan, you stupid asshole! She added, trying to crack a smile through her stains of mascara streaking down her cheeks. Oh, no! Oh, Jimmy! I wheezed as last night's events raced through my mind. What, Dan? Did you find him? Faye again asked through tears. Oh God, Faye, he's, he's gone. I responded. Gone? What do you mean gone? Faye replied. I don't know, baby, but <coughs> his caravan is, is completely destroyed. It's in a pile. But, oh no, Dan. Dan, I'm so sorry. She again responded. It's all my fault, Faye. I should never have invited him up here. I cried. It's not your fault, Dan. He's your friend and you would have done the same for him, she added. I began trying to stand when suddenly I remembered the truck, the enormous dark hairy figure leaning in and grabbing my legs. Oh shit, I croaked out, Faye almost dropping me in a panic. How did I, how did I get here? I asked. I was going to tell you inside. There was more to tell you, Dan. More? What? I responded, looking utterly confused. Let's get you back inside. I I'll explain. Once inside, Faye went on to explain to me how she was waiting, looking out the window for me, as first light broke through the trees. I suddenly appeared, but wasn't alone. Carrying me was one of these creatures, a huge male, completely black as night, at least eight feet tall. She panicked at first, but then... She see he was actually helping return me home. I laughed in response, but her eyes and face told me she wasn't kidding. But I... I began before realising that last night wasn't an attack to kill me. But it was a rescue of sorts. It had to be. Otherwise... Otherwise I would be dead right now. Confused and battered, I made my way into the cabin with Faye, holding me up. Let's get you cleaned up, mister. She said with her soul warming eyes staring into mine. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I replied before entering the warm and cosy cabin. A couple of days had passed and a lot had happened. We assumed Jimmy was all but dead or worse. And as I got washed and clothed, Faye discovered an old worn out journal. It was on the inside of my jacket pocket. At first, she assumed it was mine, but when she showed it to me, I, of course, had never seen it before in my life. Well, if it's not yours, then who? Faye asked. Let me see. I responded. 
She passed it over to me as I lay on the couch in the living room, still recovering from the accident in the truck days before. It was an old, worn, tan or oxblood colour leather journal, its pages yellowed from age. It looks really old, I said to Faye. I opened it up and the inside of the cover had a message just barely visible. It read, To Stuart, may this journal help you unlock the secrets of the forest. With love always, your wife, Penny. I read it aloud to Faye as we both realised this was the journal of the previous owner of the cabin. It's him, I said both excited and puzzled. The old man's journal. He must have known about these creatures. They must be the secrets of the forest. I remarked again excitedly and then winced at the pain reminded me how battered and bruised I truly was. As we studied this dusty old journal, so many things made sense. Faced dreams or nightmares my paranoia and the strange haunting noises that would accompany us throughout the night. There was detailed drawings and maps of locations I was yet to understand fully. This is incredible. He must have studied them for decades, I said. Yeah, look at this, Faye responded, pointing to a new page near the back of the journal. On the page was a detailed description of two different dogman species or variations. Each one highlighted their dangers and characteristics. Above was a small paragraph that read as follows. After many years of coexisting with these ancient beasts, I have learnt an abundance of knowledge, growing not only my knowledge, love, but respect and fear for these creatures. One thing is now for certain. I have reached some sort of agreement with the pack to the west, deeper within Winlatter Forest. The Dogman pack from around the higher elevation of hills and underneath Winlatter Forest in the caves are of different nature. All they do is seek and destroy, eat and conquer. They are by far the most ruthless and cunning species on the planet, besides mankind. Perhaps one can hope the ancient pack from deeper within will annihilate them to extinction before any more hikers and campers get attacked. My heart grows heavy with this knowledge. I must do something. Do you think the other dogman pack, the ones who saved you, do you think they gave this to you for us to find? Fate asked, looking as blown away as I. I, I don't know. I guess so. I mean, I, I remember Faye. It was dragging me out of the truck, but it was gentle. It's possible, I guess, I replied. The next few days were spent recovering and researching these marked locations on Google Maps, many of which were within a couple of miles of our cabin. The journal also went on to explain predatory habits and food, also a detailed hierarchy or family tree of the ancient pack to the west, showing a developed system in place with a leader and general down to foot soldiers, each branch given a particular role within the pack society. Stuart had even been to the cave, some of which we did not know existed. Again, he had made a diagram of the cave's drawings. From his theories, it depicted an ancient species of wolf-like bipedal creatures, the Dogman, stretching back before the Dark Ages itself, almost before time itself. As the new week approached, Faye and I planned to finally go investigate this westward pack and see if we could replicate Stuart's understanding with them. It was already clear that they were beyond basic carnivorous notions. Perhaps they would help us find Jimmy, or at least help me exact my revenge on the others. I'm a Londoner. We don't do settled. It was time to even the playing field. When Jimmy first arrived, I had met him outside and he handed me a duffel bag of ammo and guns. Nothing spectacular, but again, what the hell did I know about guns? The old East End gangsters had shotguns and pistols, Seemed to work well enough for them, although they wasn't dealing with eight foot plus beasts. Inside, as expected, was a Colt 45 and a double barrel sawn off shotgun. Yeah, as I said, very East End. <laughs> I packed the shotgun ready loaded into my backpack and holstered the 45 on my waist. Part of me wanting to say in the mirror, Do you feel lucky, punk? Well, do you? But reality and the weight of the situation soon blew that thought from my mind. 
We headed out in a new truck Faye had bought from the farmer down the road and made our way back down the horrendous dirt road. It was about a mile and a half to the west of the cabin. The forest became much thicker and light was soon diminished by the thick canopy of ancient oak trees. Glancing at Faye, she looked just as worried as me. At some point in the road, it began to head down into a deep ravine until the road simply ran out. From here, it was a five minute walk, according to Stuart's journal. I want you to wait here and keep the engine running, but lock the doors. I said to Faye, knowing full well she wasn't the type to listen, especially when it was one of my plans. I don't think so, Dan. It's not like you did well the last time you came out here into their home. She responded with a venomous tone, followed by her bursting out laughing at my apparent face of shock. Yeah, I knew you was going to say something like that, I replied. Well then, let's get going. We're losing light by the minute, she added. Slowly and carefully we made our way through the thick vegetation. I checked the safety was off on my pistol. Minutes went by before we knew we weren't alone, as dark shadows raced past us like a blur of fur. Up into the canopy of the tall trees, some darting into little openings in the pitch black rocky outcrops, only to turn around, their yellow eyes glowing back at us. My stomach turned with panic as thoughts of this is a very bad idea raced through my mind. Faye gripping my hand in hers as we approached a turn into a small clearing. We were met with a fairly large mouth to another cave. This one, much larger than the first with the drawings. Scratches evident all over the outer rock face from no doubt a millennia of these creatures. As we moved within 20 feet, a huge male, black as night, came charging out full speed. We both gasped, but as it got within feet of us, there was a roar from within the cave's darkness. Silence fell in the forest. Only the leaves rustling in the trees could be heard. This great black creature prowled around us in a circle and soon was met with two others. Then more and more appeared above the cave looking down on us and surrounded us in the clearing. Again, no growling emitted from these creatures as they seemed to study us. Without any sound, an enormous alpha male and beta female of the pack emerged from the inky blackness and made their way over to us. These creatures stood easily nine plus foot tall, the male possibly more. Faye's hand tightened around mine as we both stood there completely at their will. If we were on the lunch menu, there was nothing I or Faye could do now. The two leaders studied us up and down, sniffed loudly and made these strange grunts or squeals or shrieks. I got down low and Faye followed suit, making sure not to look them in the eyes. Inside my pack I had two legs of lamb from the farmer and Faye also had hers filled with offal. She emptied it out onto the forest floor with a loud wet slop. I raised the meat in the air and sat each one down in front of the alpha and beta, slowly stepping back to join Faye. There was a pause and the silence felt deafening. Then the alpha grunted to a smaller male who crawled over and collected the pile of offal. The alpha then reached down and grabbed the lamb leg, raising it into his snout and with an enormous crunch bit through the bone clean in one go. I decided now was a good time to show the journal to them and in doing so I was met with a whining sound of sorts and then a nod. Well at least that's how it appeared to us. Not wanting to overstay our welcome I thanked them for saving my life and we backed away slowly back into the direction of our truck. Their eyes never left us but Faye and I agreed they were not being aggressive just as the journal had said. As we got closer to the truck, the forest erupted with noise from the east, towards the lake, towards our cabin. Loud howls and roars screamed across the forest and valley. I glanced at the Alpha, and he had already reared up on his hind legs, completely bipedal. He roared an immense deep roar and signalled with his hand, like a general to his soldiers, to move out. Glancing back at Faye and I, again, he nodded, and then, in a lightning-fast reaction, he jumped and cleared 30 feet of brush to a tall oak tree, and his pack soon joined him as they moved out towards an easterly direction. It was clear now. This war had been going on for a very, very long time, and we 
were caught up in the middle of a chaotic, violent clash of teeth, claws and muscle. We have to move out now, I said as realisation that others were heading this way and we were severely in danger. I'm way ahead of you, shouted Faye, jumping in the truck. As we both jumped in like Starsky and Hutch, I floored the gas, hoping we could make it back to the cabin before they got to us out here in the open. Chapter 5 in the series entitled The Winlatter Forest Secrets. Without further ado, let's get straight into that. We just barely made it back to the cabin in one piece, the treacherous dirt road making any fast progress impossible. As we tried desperately to get back, the others descended on the area en masse, some bursting from the trees either side of us, others I could see parallel in us as we bounced and flew through the enormous muddy puddles, some as high as the front of my truck, water washing over the front of the hood. Both of us were screaming for our lives and again I was almost sure that this was it. We were to be torn to shreds by these creatures, consumed, and nobody would be any wiser. Yep, there would probably be a, if we're lucky that is, a news coverage in the same style of bullshit we had watched time and time again since moving up here. A group of campers or young couple have gone missing, blah blah blah. The usual lies that they fed the public. But something incredible happened. Just as these beasts closed in on us and one stood out on the road ahead, our hearts were in our mouths as we brought the truck to a complete stop and reached for my shotgun. They began to circle and bang at the truck. Then a large dark black dogman scratched its claws into the body from the rear all the way down the front to face side door. I watched it in the wing mirror getting closer and closer. I started yelling to Faye to steer as I shoot when an almighty thundering came from all around us. And without warning, the dogmen were attacked from all sides by our new friends, the ancient pack. I wasted no time in hitting the gas and firing two shots at the huge dogman in front of us by just ten feet. The shot tearing into the side and right shoulder. It growled in anger as white hot pain seared through its wounds. But still, it stood glaring at us before finally it too was tackled as a monstrous mouthed dogman began ripping into it with such ferocity. The sound was like tearing into wet clothes. As the two enormous prehistoric creatures sank tooth and claws into each other, blood and bits of flesh sent flying through the air, some of which landing on the rich green leaves of the brush with a sickening splatter. Our ears simply hurt with the sheer volume they produced. It was dwarfing that of a male lion's. We flew around them as best we could but were forced to drive up into the brush to evade the battle before us. Finally, getting back on a dirt road, we gunned it as best we could as the forest either side of us was flashing past. As we rocked and bounced over the road, here and now it offered glimpses of other dogman battles taking place in the surrounding forest. Finally, we rounded the steep bend before our driveway and came flying round it like we had stolen the truck. With an almighty final screech and slide, we came to a final stop outside the cabin. Lock every window when we get in and I'll check the doors, I said to Faye. She nodded as we both jumped out and made a mad dash for the front door, slamming it behind us and running all around like headless chickens, checking everything was secure. The forest was awash with screams and roars throughout the night, but they did seem to be further away as the night drew on. Although every now and then I could hear heavy bipedal footfall thumping across our gravel driveway, but each time it would simply fade into the dark forest. Early the next morning there was a strange ambience to the forest. We awoke to the sound of birds in the trees. It was almost as if the carnage only hours before had never even happened. Maybe the others are dead. Maybe they retreated back up to the hills, said Faye. But I knew deep down in my gut, they weren't dead, nor were they gone. Flee into the hills, yes, but they were simply gathering numbers and strength before attacking their numbers again. Only this time, 
They were angry. I desperately hoped I was wrong, and I sat with Faye on our front deck, eating for breakfast and digesting the past few hours' events. Maybe the book could tell us more. Maybe this has happened before, I said to Faye as she ate the last bite of her toast. Yeah, I'll get straight on it, she replied. Okay, I'll go make some more coffee, I added. We spent the rest of that morning until early afternoon reading through page and page of the journal. It again was incredibly detailed, right down to a form of communication that Stuart had developed with the ancient pack. It was almost like sign language, but much, much more basic. Either way, it was fascinating, and the both of us could not get enough. Faye had already worked with children learning to sign, so she picked it up no problem. As we gathered all of this information, there was a familiar noise from out front, as two blacked-out black trucks revved and roared their way up the dirt road. I ran to the window, peering out behind a curtain so not to expose my position. Oh, for God's sake! I cursed aloud. What? Who is it, Dan? asked Faye. It's them, Faye, the ghost agents. I shouted in a blind panic as I sprung across the living room to Faye and the table grabbing and sweeping up all of our notes and the journal as quickly as I could before running to the kitchen and using my boot to kick out the wooden plinth between the work surface and the floor. I placed the notes and the journal in there carefully before placing the plinth back in place. Just then, there was a loud on the door. The agent outside began shouting, Open up, sir. We know you're in there. You can let us in or we can force our way in. It's up to you, Dan. You have precisely 60 seconds from now. Laughter could be heard from some of his associates on the decking. Tick tock, Dan. Again, he shouted. What a piece of shit, I remarked to Faye. She looked at me and smiled. Go, she replied. I got up and made my way down the long oak floor hallway towards the door. His black suits like a dark distorted shadow behind the glass. As before, when I opened the door, he forced his foot in and then made his way into the cabin. Two men remained outside. Five others patrolled a small perimeter of the driveway. Look, I don't know why you're here again. We've done everything that you asked, I said angrily. Yes, indeed you did, Danny boy. But it appears you've had a... Uh... He paused, mulling over the thoughts, searching for the right words. You've had a development, did you not? Why didn't you contact me, Dan? I thought... We were clear about this agreement of ours. Hmm? I don't know what you're talking about, Agent... Oh, what's your name? Dick? But things have been as messed up as normal around here. I don't know what else you want from us. I questioned, looking him in the eyes. He seemed to ignore my response and changed the subject instantaneously. Dear shame about Jimmy, eh, Dan? He taunted with a smile across his face. I didn't respond, fearing if I did for one second acknowledge this prick... There was a good chance I would try and kill him there and then. However, fire raged in my belly, and I'm sure my face said everything that he wanted. Look, can we just get on with whatever the hell it is that you want? I demanded furiously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's get to the point, Danny boy. You have a very old journal that belongs to us, and we want it now. He replied, shaking his bare-sized fist and index finger at me. What? I replied, acting completely dumbfounded by his demand. He stood and said nothing for an awkward 20 seconds or so, just staring at me in the eyes. Right! His voice boomed. You leave me no choice, boy! He exclaimed and whistled loudly. Seconds later, the front door flew open and five men, all in black balaclavas, came rushing into the cabin. What the hell do you think you're doing? Screamed Faye and I as they began turning the place upside down, smashing through our belongings. Give us the journal, Dan. The agent screamed again, then striking me across my face. I looked and smiled back a bloody-mouthed smile. All right. Pfft. All right. I'll give it to you. Just stop this bullshit. I responded, spitting blood from my mouth at his boots. You don't seem too sure, Dan. He shouted back at me over the smashing and crashing his goons were causing to our beautiful home. Yes, yes, I'm sure. Just call them off. I screamed. God, I wanted to annihilate this jumped-up excuse for a thug. Ha oh, ha if we were in London, he and his men would be in a world of pain. A trip south of the river ought to fix this prick's attitude, no problem, I thought to myself. And just then, 
I had an idea. <laughs> whoa, whoa! He shouted as his men ceased destroying our home. Dust hanging heavy in the air, bits and pieces of wood and glass sliding or falling to the floor. Well, where is it, Dan? He asked, wiping bits of dust and flakes of paint off his shoulder. I don't have it on me, I replied. He raised his hand to hit me again, but I cut him short and grabbed his wrist. I can take you to it, but it's not going to be easy, I said whilst meeting his stare down. Hmm. Okay. Where then, Dan? You better start talking, boy. He boomed. Okay, mate, okay. I I'll tell you, but you ain't going to like it, I replied, still maintaining eye contact. His eyelids narrowed and his brow frowned at me. I gave it the best poker face I could. He paused and a stagnant silence hung in the air. All right, let's hear it then. He beckoned with his hands. Okay, well, we headed west to the deeper part of the forest about a mile plus. Then we had to hike further on foot until we came upon this huge cave entrance and he cut me off. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, you expect me to believe that you entered this cave? Well, you already know about the creatures that lurk around here, Dan, he shouted. Well, we thought we were far enough away from the cabin and the pack that lives nearby. I responded, trying to sound the dumbest I had ever in my entire life. Hmm, okay, but you still haven't told me about the journal, Dan, he questioned. Yeah, that's the fun part. You see, we made our way deeper into the cave until we were a good 200 metres deep. There's a slight incline, but nothing treacherous. As we moved deeper, there was a junction of separate chambers and veins of the tunnels. We flashed a flashlight into the nearest chamber to our right, and it was incredible. There was a bed and seating with an old oil lamp and table. Well, on top of the table was a book, and my guess is this is the journal you so badly want. Then why didn't you grab it and bring it back, boy? He again screamed at me. Because within a minute or two, being there, we heard an audible moan or something, and then footsteps. That was enough for us. We got the hell out of there. We didn't even care to look back as we ran to the truck. I finished, still meeting his fiery stare. He remained silent whilst tapping his index finger to his chin. He glanced at his men, who shared the same obvious worried look of uncertainty to my story. Faye stood in silence the entire time. She shot me a sly grin and nod. I took this moment of weakness as an opportunity and asked, So, what now, G.I. Dick? He glared at me and smirked. I tell you what, Danny boy. You and your wife here are going to come on a little field trip. He responded, looking smug as shit. Like he had caught us off guard, and now we thought that we faced certain death. Ha ha ha. Ah, what a prick. I played it out like an Oscar performance. What? No, no. We can't go back there. Those things, those creatures, they'll kill us all. You madman. I shouted at him before demanding he leave. Ha 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 He laughed at my response as I glared into his eyes with anger. Oh, if only he and his men knew. It was I and Faye that now had the upper hand here. Not a problem, Dan. We will return tomorrow at first light, as it's going to be getting dark here soon. But remember, we will be still watching you. He said, and again, so cocky and sure that he was still in control. Yes, it was still a risk. We didn't know for sure of the ancient pack if they still lived after the battle the night before. But hopefully, we can lead them into the ancient's cave and from there, if things go to plan, well, I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, they didn't see them coming. With that, they headed out to the trucks and were gone, at least until morning. I closed the front door and turned to Faye. It's even funny among all the chaos with dust still settling. The taps in the kitchen burst, sending flumes of water to the floor. She just laughed, and then I laughed, and together we creased up into fits of laughter. If we pull this off, we won't be seeing them anymore, I said to Faye as she wiped away a tear from her eyes and cheeks. I goddamn hope so. Look at this mess. Forget it. I'll stop the water and give it a quick sweep. You need to get reading. We've got one shot at this, I added. Yeah, okay, baby. She replied before heading upstairs to get changed. The rest of the evening we studied more and more of the journal. Again, as evening swallowed daytime whole and the evil dark swaying shadows stretched their long fingers across our gravel driveway, it grew more quiet 
and those familiar sounds that had accompanied us just for one day slowly and surely dissipated until again nothing but the wind and leaves remained. I was right. They were back. We were up early around four before first light. Our stomachs turned with nerves that kept receding and then returning tenfold. It was much too much for me and I vomited in a flower pot outside on the decking. Around five as light just started breaking through the low-laying fog that had rolled up from the forest, they arrived. Showing more force in numbers than before was an extra truck accompanied them this time. I walked down my steps, my hot coffee steam blowing around in the headlights in the wind. Morning, Dan, a voice said over the hum of the engines. Looking over, I see this dumbass head leaning out the window of one of the trucks. Every now and then a glow would emit from a cigarette in his mouth. I guess that's where you got that rancid breath from, eh? I joked. He seemed to ignore my dig and said, We move out now. You have five minutes, Dan. Oh, and don't forget your wife now. A smirk washed over his face. Whatever, arsehole. Your time is coming. I muttered to myself. What, boy? He responded. I said, Faye's just coming, mate. I replied, sniggering to myself. Okay, we will follow and you lead. Don't try anything flamboyant, Danny boy. We wouldn't want Faye to get hurt or eaten, now would we? He snapped at me. I nodded and went in to get Faye, shortly returning before getting into our truck and leading the men in theirs down the long and treacherous dirt road toward the west, towards the ancient dogman cave. Do you think this will work? asked Faye. I haven't got a clue, honey, I replied. A short while later, we came to the end of the road, as forest rose up like a natural wall of solid ancient oaks. We hopped out and the other trucks followed suit, men scrambling into action. All were heavily armed and wearing full combat armour. Their faces obscured by helmets, masks and night vision headgear, various grenades and other kit hanging from certain hooks and ziplocks. Let's move out, said the agent, and they pushed me and Faith forward towards the mouth of the cave. Before we fully entered, I caught a glimpse of one of our friend's heads popping up over the top of some brush at the side of the entrance before disappearing once again out of sight. This has to work, I thought to myself. It has to, or we're dead. We progressed down, deeper and deeper into the cave, the air becoming stale and the stench clung in the air, forcing its way into our lungs. Every now and then, a heap of bones would clatter as an unsuspecting boot kicked them across the cold stone floor, forcing everyone to hold their position and brace. How much further, Dan? The agent tapped me on the shoulder and whispered. Should be a little further. I responded, hoping to God something would either happen or at least there would be a chamber up ahead that I could store them in. Where the hell are they? I again questioned in my head. A torrent of sweat beading its way down my back and forehead. The exit was now way back out of sight and we relied on our flashlights whilst the agents and his team took to their night vision headgear. A few moments later, the tunnel we had been taken opened up into a mighty cathedral-sized chamber. Immediately, I thought, shit, I never mentioned a massive chamber to them. Faye instantly glanced at me with a look of worry. She too thought, this is it. But as the agent turned around to say something, the ceiling moved above our heads and tiny rocks and dust fell to our shoulders. Each of the men looking up at the rocks above and around us in unison, Oh shit! shouted one of the men before all hell broke loose. You snaky son of a... was all the agent managed before he was grabbed by two gnarly hairy clawed hands that dug into his shoulders and under his collarbones and then he flew up into the air and into the darkness. An almighty howling so deep I thought the tunnel would collapse boomed and echoed as it was joined by more and more. The agent was soon followed by four of his team as far as I could count at the time. One man's eyes popped out of his skull as a huge hand wrapped around his head from above. Blood and tissue, severed limbs came falling down all over the floor and men. The rest of the men began panicking and forcing back to back in formation, firing uncontrolled bursts of bullets into the dark abyss around. One of the men then turned his gun on Faye and I. You're coming with me, he screamed. Suddenly, out of apparently nowhere, Jimmy emerged from the darkness and plunged his hunting knife into the man's jugular. I, grabbing Faye, hit the deck and we shuffled our way over into a dark corner behind some boulders. A moment later, one 
by one, their screams and flashes of gunfire ceased, and the only inaudible moans could be heard, with the hungry, wet slurps and snapping of jaws and bone echoed within the cave, until finally we slowly arose covered in God knows what. All around us growls and moans that resonated in my chest hummed and hooped. Jimmy! I said as he stumbled over to us, barely able to stand, his leg and stomach torn open with a nasty slash. He fell to the floor as we embraced each other. I thought you were dead, you old git! I laughed. All around this enormous chamber, yellow and amber eyes looked back at us, glowing in the pitch black abyss. Thank you again! I said aloud with Faye and Jimmy at my side. Then, a large brown or black female dogman, from what we could tell in the dismal flashlight, approached us and soon others from above and around joined her. A large male dogman grunted at us, shaking his head up and then down, over and over. I think he wants us to bow to her, Faye remarked, and so we all did. Then the three of us decided it had been long enough of a visit. Let's get going, I said to Faye as she was signing something to the large female. With a nod of her enormous head, she turned and disappeared into the darkness once more. The pack following suit, and one by one, they disappeared and were gone. We made our way back to the truck, and I drove Jimmy straight to the hospital. It was going to be fine, save for some major dehydration, concussion, and cuts needing a lot of stitches. I returned to the cabin to find Faye asleep on the sofa, completely and utterly exhausted from the week's events. How the hell did Jimmy survive? And why was he there in that cave? I questioned as I sat down and slowly drifted off to sleep. Chapter 6 in the series entitled The Winlatter Forest Secrets The Calm Before the Storm Let's get straight into that. The world will not be destroyed by evil, but by those who watch without doing anything. Albert Einstein A couple of weeks have passed since our <clears throat> excursion. The plan seemed to have worked as there was no sign of the agent and his team. And it would appear no new visitors either. Although I couldn't be sure. On the other hand, we did get a visit from a pair of dogmen the night Jimmy returned from hospital. He had recovered pretty well and discharged himself two days after arrival. Whilst he rested, Faye had been researching potential deterrents or things that we could use against the others. Something to possibly inflict pain or even paralysis could be very useful. She came across a section near the back of the journal titled Remedies and Defense. It was a fairly long list of natural medicines and herbs and of course poisons and other dangerous concoctions. Faye and I had obviously watched and read that werewolves are susceptible to hemlock or monkshood, whichever terms you prefer. Anyway, we found a description and drawing that looked incredibly similar to the gathering of bushes outside the cabin, and they also led around the side towards our utility room, and finally the bedroom window. I had actually planned to cut them down, or at least back when we first arrived here at the cabin, but after everything started, it was not on my to-do list, and it was also actually a comfort having the window partially blocked from prying eyes. The Devil's Helmet, it read. Isn't that the... I said before Faye cut me short. The bush is outside, she responded. We searched online and sure enough, they were this nasty plant. Sounds a bit dangerous to be honest, Dan, she added. Yeah, but I bet it would level the odds in our favour, I responded. We both got up and walked outside and round to the bushes. That's it, Faye said excitedly. All right, I'll go get some breathing apparatus and gloves and pff, anything else that will keep that shit away from me, I joked. Okay, baby, I'll get some food ready and I'll see you in a bit. I headed out to the hardware store 25 miles east and got kitted out with pretty much everything that I thought would be useful. <laughs> the store clerk looked at me like I was a serial killer or something as I stacked jugs, duct tape, ropes, saws and dust suits and masks. Oh, 
and I treated myself to a chainsaw. Yeah, that might have been what made him worried. He went from Mr. Chatty Paddy customer service is our main priority to, oh, uh, um, please leave the store before I call the police, written all over his face. <laughs> he asked me what the hell I was building. I told him uh, I bred large dogs, large breeds of canines. He looked puzzled and worried and then asked me, what's the chainsaw for then, mate? I was mid smiling when he caught me off guard with this, I guess. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. Um, I responded dismally. It's for uh, the, for the trees around the kennel area. Phew, ace that one, I thought. Anyway, by the time I had arrived back home, Faye and Jimmy had fully researched and planned a method of using the plant. He was going to dip the ammo in a noxious solution. Plus, we had any of the axes and knives that we was also carrying dipped in the solution. It wasn't solid that this would work, but if it did, we potentially had more control of the situation. Symptoms also included sudden paralysis and maybe, just maybe, we could finish them off as they became immobile. I hope to God it wasn't the latter, but what choice did we have? Jimmy arose late in the evening and looked to be back to his ugly old British Bulldog charm. Oh, all right guys, he said as he walked into the living room and sat down in one of the recliners. His legs akimbo, no underwear on, and with Faye's purple dressing gown on. Oh, Jimmy, put it away, you ape, Faye exclaimed aloud. Ah, oh, Jim, mate, do you mind? I said looking at him, part of me trying desperately to not laugh, and the other thinking he hadn't changed since we were young men in our teens or early twenties. Oh, sorry. He responded, turning a shade of red. Jimmy, how the hell did you survive, mate? I mean, I came to find you. There was nothing left of your caravan. And the dogmen? The whole pack must have been there, mate. I questioned him, hoping for some answers. I barely made it out, Dan. I just returned from seeing you both that evening. Ha <laughs> I was laughing to myself about what you'd said around the dinner table. And as I made my way to the caravan, I guess I never noticed him. Or... He was just that quiet, but I started to get ready for bed. Well, as soon as I turned the lights off, shadows flashed past every window. But it was just so quick, you know? I thought it was the alcohol or just that I was tired. I was just turning over and getting comfortable in bed when I looked up at the skylight. It, it was dark, like pitch black, as if zero light could get through. And then it moved. As it did so, it turned... And in the night's ambient moonlight, the moon lit its face up enough to make out details. Its eyes caught the moonlight and twinkled or shone back a glow of red. I froze instantly, Dan, as it leaned down closer and stared straight at me slowly with its mouth and lips curled up and back to reveal a cold killer's sinister grin. It wasn't curious. It was hungry as its eyes made this menacing glare that shot through my very soul. Thick drool dripped and dropped from its white jagged teeth onto the skylight. The trailer rocked and a dull heavy thump emitted from behind my head outside. It was soon followed by a loud tearing noise as claws met the flimsy fiberglass shell of my caravan. You could hear each step it took. I lay there. I was too scared to move. All rational thought was gone from my mind, trying desperately to find an appropriate response to this monster before me. Another thump came from the other end of the caravan, and I followed the sound of the footfalls with my eyes around my side and down along the wall in front of me. Then it dawned on me. It was heading for the door. Without warning, the door was ripped from the trailer and cold night air rushed inside. I was up before it had finished ripping the door and grabbed my shotgun letting off two shots through the ceiling and then grabbing my knife. I began to reload frantically but there was no time Dan. The second its head came through the door and looked at me, I stabbed violently up through the bottom jaws and its head, killing it instantly. Thank God. However the monster on the roof was now beginning to try to rip through the skylight and the gunshot had made light work of the thin roof. Plus I was now rendered momentarily deaf as a loud ringing was all I could hear. From behind me, another crashing sound as one of them charged the trailer, almost knocking it over. I was sure, Dan, that I was dead. 
I was a dead man right then, as the skylight finally gave way and a pair of huge arms and clawed hands thrashed wildly, trying to grab the collar to my top or my head. I cut at its hand pretty bad and it yelped, just like a dog, in response. Another crash and the caravan tipped up and over, sending me flying out the door. I landed face down and arse up in a huge puddle. The force of the impact completely broke the frame of the caravan and it forced in on itself. I had to act fast and I got up and made a break for the trees then. As I took five, maybe six steps, another creature stepped out of the tree line in front of me. Oh God, it looked straight into my eyes then. When I looked back at its, they glowed yellow. I mean, not like they were coloured yellow. They literally glowed yellow. Anyway, it, it stepped forward and I turned right to then see the two who had attacked me were now up and focused on me again. I, I was boxed in. Sheer rock was to my left and these, these monsters surrounded me. I began screaming at them and I thought nothing else will work now. This is it. And then the one from the tree line clocked its head to the side while still slowly approaching me. The two behind started to emit this rumbling growl and then hissed at each other. Then all three ran at me without thinking. I ran for the smallest of gaps between these thundering giant wolves or hybrids or whatever they are. They're called Dogman, Jimmy, mate. I added, before I realised how unimportant that was at this time. Sorry, Jimmy. Carry on, mate. I said with a red face. Yeah, well, I made a break for it and I could see another two dogmen emerge from the tree line in front, now joining the solitary one. I heard the other two dogmen grunt and then hiss. More to the point, they had stopped coming at me and slid to a sudden stop in the wet, muddy ground. I didn't care why or what and continued running with my knife towards the thick brush at the edge of the tree line. The persistent ringing noise was now subsiding as from behind me and my now left I heard branches snapping as howls cut through the cold dark night ambience. A low rumbling crested the breeze. It was then that I noticed a number of dogmen appear from both groups and a standoff began. The ones closer to me engaged with each other as the rest all ran from various trees and brush. I was about 20 feet from the tree line myself when a massive dogman jumped out of nowhere and landed in front of me. I realised then that I had lost my shotgun in the panic. I swear, I swear Dan, my heart stopped for a whole five seconds. I felt my knees weaken. I'd never been so terrified in all my life. It snarled at me and I spat at it. It was disgusting. If I was going to die I told myself that this fucker was going to lose an eye so he remembered me at least. He growled at me and I screamed at him a war cry and told him to come on, let's have it then. He happily accepted my offer and ran at me, mouth wide open, ready to take a bite out of me. I managed to duck the first swipe of its dirty long black claws as it wildly slashed at me and I sank my blade into its abdomen three times. But then its other hand slashed me down my back with a long stroke. Turning around, Jimmy lifted his top and the hospital dressings to reveal a series of four deep claw marks that ran the entire length of his back. Oh God, Jimmy, cried Faye at the gruesome wounds. Yeah, it's pretty, ain't it? Responded Jimmy. Oh yeah, so anyway, I nearly collapsed from the pain, but I managed to respond beautifully and I jammed my knife into his lower back. My knife ran through him like butter as I felt it hit his spine and there was this crunch his legs gave way immediately. Unfortunately, they gave way with him collapsing on top of me. The sheer weight was unbearable and it instantly started to sink his teeth down and into my legs, biting over and over. The pain was intense and I was losing this battle. Not just the battle, but also my consciousness. I was going to die. I was desperately grabbing and clawing at anything to get away, but the wet mud and this monster's weight halted any progress. It slowly stopped and started to sniff up my back until it was right in my ear. It's hot, rancid breath, unbearable, and again I could see the drool dropping down next to my face in the mud. It growled, and it... it... It sounded so sinister. It then bit down on my shoulder, and then suddenly the bite released, and the weight lifted. Puzzled, I, I turned myself over onto my back, expecting to be killed any moment. 
The rain was coming down in sheets in my face, a number of pools of blood now mixing in the puddles around me. As I turned and looked up, I see another large dogman standing at least eight or nine feet tall, pitch black in colour. It stood with its long arms extended holding my would-be ticket to death dogman up in the air by its throat and then snapped its left forearm in one attempt. It then ripped at the wounds to its abdomen and within seconds the creature's intestines and other organs fell out all over the floor and myself. A spray of breath, blood and spit and no doubt bits of my legs and shoulder flew into the air like a valve on a gas tank being released. The moonlight captured it beautifully, I have to say. It dropped its lifeless, hairy, blood-mattered body on the dirt with the crumpled thump. Again, my consciousness failed and returned. When it did so, I was being carried through the forest. I could see this magnificent fight of nightmare creatures going toe to toe, getting further and further away. And then again, blackness took over. And then I came round again and I was in an underground tunnel, I guess. It was cold, dark and there was the sound of scuttling bugs echoing around me. I tried to free myself but the blood loss was too great and I slipped into unconsciousness for a final time. It was them, the ancient pack, Jimmy, said Faye. Yeah, Jim. There are two packs there, but it appears they're very different in nature. We've now got an understanding with them, or of sorts, I added. Yeah, I can see that, Jimmy replied, laughing aloud. Well, anyway, Dan, I, I woke up in that huge cavern, surrounded by them. I, of course, panicked at first and tried to get up, but my wounds were too bad. One of the females started to slowly approach me. I recoiled back against the cold, hard rock and screamed, No! Please, no! I begged. But then it grabbed an old flask and threw it to me. I, I was astonished. I was sure this was me. Game over. Never to be found. Bloody dogman chow. But when it threw the flask over, it landed in our sea. It was full of fresh water. The female then turned and loped away towards a large ledge where he sat, the big guy, the one that had saved my life. He was sitting watching me, but his eyes didn't suggest anything of anger. I drank the water greedily and laid back down to rest. It was clear I wasn't leaving any time soon. Then I was taken care of by an older grey-coloured dogman treating my wounds, and he mixed something like a herbal mix that had packed into my wounds. God, it stung like crazy at first, Dan, but it soon soothed the pain. And then, I don't know how long passed, but you guys showed up. I'm sorry, Dan. Fay, I'm sorry, I should have believed you both that night. He finished with his hands shaking and face a pasty white colour. Nonsense, Jimmy, mate. It's not every day that frickin' werewolf-looking creatures attack your caravan and try to eat your face. I'm... we're glad you're here and alive. There is much to tell you. I responded, patting him on the arm. We spent the next few hours updating Jimmy on everything and showed him the journal explained about the agency that kept an eye on us and those things. He was amazed at how much had happened since he had been missing. Soon, myself and Faye headed off to bed feeling happy that Jimmy was alive and well. The agents had long gone. My eyes were closed before I hit the pillow as I was so tired. Jimmy remained up, studying the journal. We awoke to loud footfall outside running across our decking on two sides of the cabin. I got up and another set of footfalls thumped rapidly across the roof of our bedroom. You could hear the claws clicking and clacking against the timber and slate tiles. Faye sat upright in bed, eyes wide open and her jaw even wider. I signalled for her to be quiet and stay put. I was making my way out of the bedroom into the upstairs hall to then look down and into the living room where Jimmy was supposed to be sleeping. But I ended up clumsily bumping into Jimmy and dropped my flashlight with a loud crash on the wooden floor. We both winced at the noise as the footsteps on the roof and outside abruptly ceased. Good one, Dan, Jimmy laughed. I shot him a sarcastic grin in response. They're under the cabin, Dan, Jimmy whispered. Eh? You what? I replied. Under. I, I was trying to get sleep when the floor started to creak and I heard scratching. It wasn't loud, but then it started to thump around under there. 
The scratching got worse and at one point the damn sofa started to rise up and down. With me on it, Dan. Again, his face was pasty white as a sheet. I looked down over the banister and listened. Sure enough, the scratching and thump could be heard. It's like they or it was trying to find a weakness in the flooring of the cabin. Then, I couldn't believe my eyes as the boards made a loud creaking and started to bend or flex upwards and then back down again and then back up again. Let's grab the guns, I said to Jimmy as he nodded and we grabbed some gear and proceeded downstairs. Faye wasn't happy with it but we had to see how many were out there or at least kill it before it burst through the flooring. I made my way to the bottom step and just as I touched the ground floorboard, a rush of chaos exploded outside and under our feet. Dark shadows dashed across the decking and the windows onto the gravel drive and back into the forest. That was too easy, I said. Yeah, I agree, something's not right, replied Jimmy whilst making his way to the window peering out from behind a curtain. I followed suit to the opposite windows, peering out to pitch dark and a cold early morning. Sunrise was at least two hours off. It took maybe two minutes for my eyes to adjust, but when they did, it was shocking to say the least. Animals everywhere. Hanging from the trees, the roof draped over our handrail on the decking, blood smeared all over the windows and walls. Soon the smell of death and decay hit us and we guessed that more carcasses were laying underneath our feet, under the cabin. Decapitated heads of sheep and goats with their tongues ripped out, staked haphazardly on the fence and decking. We would later find out the entire roof was littered with up to 23 carcasses of deer, rats and rabbits ripped and stuffed into vents or the drain pipes. I begged Faye not to look outside but she did and a shrill scream pierced the early morning ambience. This was not a good sign. Clearly they were trying to provoke us. This has to stop, I, I don't know how, but it has to, I uttered. Don't worry Dan, I'll make some calls. We'll run them out that forest, or die trying. The Wind Lutter Forest Secrets Chapter 7 The Heart of a Londoner Let's get straight into that. The carnage and the gore that the others had left for us to find was a sinister reminder of their brutality and vengeance. The true force of nature. Where carcasses lay torn to shreds, piles of scat and puddles of urine covered the entire decking and roof's areas. The essence burned at our eyes and throat. This was a clear sign of, of dominance and disrespect. Myself and Jimmy spent most of the day scrubbing dried blood and shit off of the walls, but still the smell hung in the air, seemingly seeping into the cabin. Faye running around lighting Josh sticks every half an hour. Her mother was due to visit at the end of the month. But seriously, we needed to fix the situation and fast. We couldn't live in fear like this. I'm damn sure we couldn't sell up. Jimmy left the next morning, heading back to Stepney in London. Said he had a few errands to run, but wouldn't elaborate at all. He said he would be back in two days and not to start the party without him. That evening, Faye and I sat down to eat as heavy wind howled and whistled while the seemingly never-ending rain rapped on the glass panes. The news said a severe storm would be blowing in for the next 24 hours or so. Flood warnings were issued for those living in the valleys below. As I sat eating my lamb chops, I wondered how Bill Dunham, the old farmer from down the road, how he had lived here like this his entire life, knowing these creatures lurked over the fields, forests and mountains, coming in closer during the early hours to snatch possibly a lamb or calf for its pleasure. How does a boy grow up here and sleep? My nightmares as a child were sea monsters and spiders, yet here in real life we have walking, breathing nightmares. I had become so enthralled in my dinner and thoughts of this beautiful yet mysterious and terrifying landscape that I hadn't realised Faye was talking to me. Dan! She raised her voice finally, waking me from my days. Look, there's more! Her face with a look I had grown all too familiar with over the last few months. What more, eh? I replied. Yes, look, she added, pointing back to the TV. J 
Gemma Parker, 23, from South Wales. Richard Zenham, 24, also of South Wales, have been declared missing after not returning from a camping trip in the Lake District last weekend. Both of the missing adults' mobile phones have remained off since Tuesday morning, and authorities are trying to trace the location of the last signal received. In other news... A small group of vegans reported out hiking to a health retreat near the Winlatter Forest area have also not checked in with officials at the health retreat after six members of the guests went on a fungi and wild berry picking class early Monday morning. The group was due back around afternoon but failed to show. The group were between the ages of 27 and 65. No contact has been made and officials are concerned for both missing persons groups given the horrendous weather that has swept into the valley over the last few hours. Search and rescue teams are out with dog teams and we'll keep you up to date as the news progresses. That's so messed up, Dan. How long has it been going on for? Faye questioned, frustrated and upset at the thought of innocent lives lost to this pack of wild monsters. I know, baby, it's sick as what it is. I replied, reaching across the table to hold her soft hands. Even the vegans aren't safe. Faye slapped at my hand and told me to shut up. That night, the cabin creaked as storm gales whipped and lashed at its wooden walls. I thought I see movement outside around 2am as I got up to grab a drink from the kitchen, but the weather gave little in regards of clear line of sight. The strong oaks battered and swayed in the strong winds. They had been here for hundreds of years, weathered many storms over the years, and at that moment, as I stared out into the bleak, cold, windy night, it was like they were a symbol of our strength during our own storm. I returned to bed quietly before settling off into a deep sleep. The next day, and the weather had deteriorated terribly, I decided I wanted to speak with Bill, the old farmer, and so I set off in the rain and wind down the winding country lanes until a couple of miles down the road I pulled into his property. It was an old, traditional English cottage with a thatch roof and white walls, hanging baskets packed with geraniums hanging from the outside walls, while a small pond, complete with a bridge and plastic stock, accompanied the scenic plot. Bill opened the door to a small porch and I quickly evaded the torrential rain. Bill was wearing the same navy blue woolen jumper and a dusty old cap, his large barrel belly sticking out like an expectant mother. Bill, great to see you, I greeted. Dan, it's good to see you are still with the land of the living, <laughs> he replied with a hearty chuckle. Yes, Bill, just about, I responded. So what can I do you for, boy? He asked, scratching his grey stubbly beard. Nothing urgent, really, Bill. I just wanted to check how you was doing and see if I can buy some lamb from you. Oh, I see. Well, sure thing, Dan. I'm doing well, but nothing new here. I'm certainly doing better than the sheep over there, that is. He said, pointing to the field right of his cottage. How much lamb did you want, Dan? He asked. Oh, um, well, I stumbled. Can we get a whole lamb? I finally managed to ask. His brow frowned and head crooked at me, puzzled like a Labrador. Why on earth do you want a whole lamb, boy? He said, with his voice loudly and more angry. Well, it's complicated, but we have... His eyes met mine with a fire in them. We have an agreement of sorts with one of the packs, Bill. I replied. Agreement? Pah! He shouted at me. No, I'm serious, Bill. There's, there's, there's two different packs, the ancient ones and... They saved our lives. I protested, hoping he would see my reasoning. Different packs, my ass, boy. I've lived here my whole life. Ain't nothing that I haven't seen. There was only one pack, and they are a menace. Even if there was a different pack, they're all the same anyway, Dan. Rabid, wild, dogs or wolves, whatever they are, they are no good. Bill declared, looking a rosy colour as his frustration brewed deep in his gut. I would normally agree with you, Bill, but... You, you have to see them yourself. The ancient ones, they are different. They really did save Faye and my life when we could have been slaughtered. No problem. Please, Bill, just do me this one favour. There are only shots, if anything, at killing the others once and for all. I responded hoping he would at least be willing to reason some belief in my words. Okay, okay, boy. I will help you out, but don't ever turn your back on those creatures. That is what that old fool Stuart who used to own the cabin did. I tried warning him too not to get involved, but he said the same things. He even said he'd slept down there with them and set up a study. Ha <laughs> ha! I will bring your lamb up this afternoon. He replied, Thank you, Bill. Honestly, thank you. 
Once we get past this storm, I want you to come and meet them. Meet them? No, I'm fine with the girls here and the cows, he added whilst pointing towards the sheep. We shook hands and I hopped back into my truck and headed off back home. In my mirror, I could see Bill with a wave of his hand walking back into his cottage, shaking his head as he did so. Around 3pm, Bill pulled up outside our cabin. The trees still being battered by the wind and rain, thunder and lightning now crackled across the valley as the thick cloud coverage gave the mid-afternoon a dark, ambient light. Bill refused to take any money, only stating that whatever mad plan I had in mind had better work. He couldn't afford any more loss of livestock, and he was getting too old to defend the place. He had brought up two whole lambs and buckets of offal, all of which still steamed slightly in the ice-cold rain. Thanks, Bill. I, I really owe you one. No, nonsense, boy. What are neighbours for if we can't help each other? He replied cheerfully before tipping his hat at Faye and I and getting back in his truck and driving off into the distance down the dirt road. We loaded up the truck and drove down through the winding quagmire of a road to the ancient cave area. It wasn't three minutes of us being out of the truck before one of the young males and a female came loping out of the thick brush behind us. Soon we were joined by many of the ancient dogman pack and the alpha stepped forward. He crouched his enormous frame down lower to the flatbed. Full of lamb, a loud audible snort and sniffing coming from his immense snout, and a chesty... <sighs> he growled aloud before picking up one of the lambs in his mighty jaws, slowly turning around and heading back into the dank darkness of the cave. The young female and male next came forward, and each grabbed the leg of the remaining lamb. They fought around just like children over food and ended up ripping it in two halves. The rest of the pack gathered around and grabbed the remaining meat and offal before one by one, heading off back into the trees and cave. Faye and I were still stunned by this incredible interaction. Both looked at each other and smiled. We hopped back into the truck completely soaked through and covered in blood and goodness knows what. Slowly but surely we drove back up the horrendous road. Along the way there, there were many waterfalls and torrents of muddy brown water washing down the road either side like a miniature rapids stirring up the earth and the rocks as it passed. Clumps of long grass and turf floating like islands downhill. At one point it got so bad I was sure the road would simply be washed away in a landslide. But we finally made it back around 4.30pm and raced to get in the shower. Yeah, of course, I was a perfect gentleman and let Faye jump through first. While she was showering, I sat in the living room and opened the old tattered journal, fingering my way through the thick aged yellow pages. I turned to a map near the middle of the journal, which was titled, Valley of the Woes. Woes? I wonder what that means, I said to myself. On the bottom of the map, I could see the peak ridges lying in the mountains behind us, and the other side of that, down beyond and deep into the forested valley below. There were a number of small, jotted notes and references to unknown coordinates. In some of these notes it warned of the woes, or wild man. I sat there confused for a while thinking, wild man? Isn't what we're dealing with already a wild man? The notes told of an ancient burial location, many of which were due to great battles in ancient times, some warning of areas where hikers and campers had already gone missing. Actually, they were eaten alive by the grassland moors wild man. Again, it was a note of two variations of the same species. The other wild men were found in the forest and underground in the cave system. The first was the clan of Juntor, king of the moorlands. The second was the clan of Oakenreed, king of the forest and oars. In a detailed sketch both clans looked fierce and jurassic in size. Long, heavy muscular arms hung below the knees. Thick, heavy hair covered them from head to toe. Their eyes glowed a bright red or amber, and it is said that the intelligence of this creature matched that of most adult humans even possibly a type of telepathic mindset capability like that of the dogman with mind speaking. And then it struck me. Sasquatch, or Bigfoot, whichever term catches your fancy. Suddenly, without any warning, an enormous crashing sound of glass shattering erupted from upstairs, followed by Faye's screams of terror and a booming roar suddenly swallowed her screams. Before I even got halfway up the stairs, another crash of glass followed with a dense thump from outside. I heard Faye scream a muffled cry for help. My heart plummeted to the depths of my stomach as I turned and jumped back down the remaining steps of the staircase, grabbing my Glock from the mantelpiece. I ran outside not knowing what to expect, gun drawn. 
the rain still beating down on pummeling an attack on my face and eyes. I began searching the outside and the windows of the property while screaming for her. Faye! Faye! A quiet yelp came from around the side of the cabin to my right. As I rounded the corner, I see her being dragged in the dirt and leaves up into the forest surrounding Winlatter Peak. I didn't want to risk firing a shot, so I started to follow. But as soon as I got within 15 feet of that tree line, I was met with three gigantic males, who at the sight of me started to head towards me gradually, picking up pace until finally all three were running at me, saliva falling from their lethal mouth, their eyes wide with predatory malice. Everything seemed to fall into place like a switch. It was either that, or I just lost all care in the world. At that moment, all that I see was an obstacle in the damn way between my wife and myself. Almost a tunnel vision effect washed over me as these giant wolves thundering towards me on two feet came closer and closer and closer. I snapped out of it and began unloading the Glock, then reloading again before the damn gun jammed as they began to circle me. I was sure my time was done once more. Phase also. I dropped the gun to the wet gravel and watched as they sneered at me, showing their long canines in the process. As if almost gloating at me, their red eyes shone back at me as the cabin's outside lights caught their eye shine. The ground vibrated with each heavy step each dog man took. Suddenly one of them started growling and groaning, which then turned to a choking and collapsing to the floor in front of me. The other two carried on the charade of intimidation, but but within another 30 seconds, the effects of the laced bullets took their effect on them also, both very suddenly falling to the ground and convulsing violently, blood and mucus foaming at their mouths. I have to admit, I had completely forgotten about the devil's helmet laced on each bullet. Genius is what it was. The first affected now stone cold dead, and with the other two clinging to their sorry existence, I walked over to the shed and grabbed the shovel laying outside it. The spotlight came on suddenly as I crossed its path, lighting up the immediate area. I turned to now see all three bathed in bright light, every detail now clear as day. The hair, skin, wrinkles all right before me. I walked back over and stood above the largest dogman, his enormous chest rising and then falling in shallow, gurgled breaths. His eyes widened when I dragged the metal against the ground before finally I put the blade of the shovel over his throat and my boot on top. He was scared. I could tell. Deep in that fearsome animal, terror raced as he realised his time was now up. He was completely paralysed and slowly drowning to death on his own blood. I leaned down to meet his eye and said, Bad dog. Before I finally kicked down hard with a slick slicing and crunch noise, I cut his head clean off. The other two were given no lesser treatment and after that I ran back inside to gather weapons and supplies. I was just heading out the door when Jimmy came screeching up onto the driveway. Running out, I chucked my gear into the back and shouted, No time to explain, we need to go now! Then, launching myself into the passenger seat. But Dan, what now, Jimmy? I cut him short and he floored it out of the gravel driveway, sending a wave of gravel and stones into the surrounding tree line and out onto the dirt road once more. What the hell's going on, Dan? Asked Jimmy as we hit the steep and rugged terrain like a rally driver. It's Faye. They took her. One of them broke in through the window upstairs and dragged her up the mountain, Jimmy. So, why are we going this way, Dan? He replied, looking more than confused. Because I can't even get close to her with the other's garden or whatever it is that they are planning on doing with her. I mean, why would they take her? What do they want her for? We need the ancients' help and then they can track her. I replied as we reached the end of the road and then jumped out to run the rest of the trail to the ancients' cave. The forest was now pitch black, only the moonlight barely breaking the canopy above casting strange threads of light sporadically here and there. We reached the cave and were soon once again met with the pack at the entrance. I didn't know if he would understand me or not, but it was my only shot. After five or so minutes of me madly explaining the situation and drawing some crude depiction in the dirt, the alpha nodded and then walked over to the cave drawings. Next to the drawings depiction, was clearly the ancestors of the pack, but it was also something else, something larger. After closer inspection, I realised it was the Sasquatch, or again Woodwoes. I turned to the Alpha and said, Land of the Woes. I know, big guy, I know, but I need your help. 
Faye needs your help. The Alpha raised his head high and howled a long ear splitting howl and then signalled for his soldiers to move out. Jimmy and I nearly fell over from the sheer power of his howl. We raced back to the truck and hit the gas. As we flew up the dirt road, the ancients flew by either side of us and I got to witness for the first time how agile and powerful they truly were as they smashed their way through young trees and snapped branches seven plus inches thick like damn toothpicks. We could see the difference in the ancients to the others. The physique muscular but in proportion to the body top heavy for sure but with enormous shoulders and chest which then tapered down at the waist but the legs were enormous in muscle mass. The others looked similar but all wrong. Their bodies muscular beyond reason but the proportions were all wrong. Where the ancients tapered at the waist the others were not. I could only assume that this made them less agile. Their legs were long and although muscular they were nothing compared to the ancients. If this was war, I'd pick the right side, or at least I hope so. Jimmy and I finally reached the turnoff for the mountain trail and began climbing up to the summit. The pack stayed close, although three large males ran ahead scouting the area. As we got further up, the forest started to thin out and we could see the top. Goodness knows what lies beyond that summit, I thought to myself. At the top, we got a view of the forest and the land below. It was thick evergreens and marsh wetland. The Alpha looked at me and then pointed to an easterly direction and off into the distance, about a quarter mile or so, was a small clearing of sorts and what appeared to be the mouth of a cave. Over there, I asked. He responded with my chest rattling as I stood next to him. Okay, let's go, I responded before jumping off the small ledge and starting the descent into the Valley of the Woes. Myself and Jimmy checking our weapons were off safety as we descended to the mossy, covered, rocky terrain. As soon as we reached the tree line, the air was pungent and thick. Not a bird or bug or rodent in sight. Yep, it was eerie to say the least. Within a few feet, we found what looked to be the other's trail as thick brush and trees were parted as if a train had ran through them, deeper into a particularly thick, swampy and dark part of the forest. It was clear. Whatever they were planning, they wanted to keep out of sight of the Sasquatch as much as we did. A short while later, we had to be getting closer to the cave when suddenly, out of nowhere from the trail ahead of us, a huge black object came rolling and tumbling down the trail towards us. At first, Jimmy and I were confused as to what it was, but as it got closer in the dark forest lighting and slowed in pace, it was all too clear. It was one of the scout's heads, decapitated and bloody. As soon as it stopped rolling and came a roar so loud and so close that I and Jimmy fell backwards into a bush. Seconds later, one of the others emerged towering over us and then followed by many more from all directions. This was it as Jimmy nodded to me and screamed before unloading hell on these suckers. We both began firing and the alpha stepped between Jimmy and I and then letting out a roar into the face of the dogman marching on us. He then uppercutted him ripping off the lower jawbone in one swift motion. We should move and try and cut ahead, I suggested to Jimmy, and he agreed and we moved to the side of the battle. As we crept around taking a wider berth as possible, the carnage, a lone male dogman, around eight foot sprung out of the tree to my right and began attacking me. I only just managed to spin around and let off three shots into its torso before it crashed upon me, sinking its teeth into my shoulder. Jimmy ran in kicking at its head as it growled and chewed down on my flesh. The pain was blinding. It was just about to take a bite out of my face when the poison took its toll when it suddenly choked and then coughed up blood and phlegm into my face and eyes. I couldn't move or see. What did I tell you about kissing dogs, Dan, mate? Jimmy scoffed at me. Shut up, Jimmy. Just get this damn thing off me, will you? I replied, wheezing under the dead weight of the creature on top of me. Yeah, yeah, sorry, mate, added Jimmy, laughing to himself. We gathered ourselves again and set off, and around 25 minutes later it cleared out and the route to the cave was in sight. We peered over some bushes to check if it was clear, and to my dismay, there were three huge dogmen guarding the entrance. Oh, come on, I whispered. Jimmy was preoccupied and fumbling around, and then slowly turned back around with a high-powered sniper rifle, chambering around, the biggest smile I had ever seen on my best friend of over 25 years' face. I wish you would invite me more, Dan. This is the best fun I've had in years, he grinned. Jimmy slowly crept closer to a better vantage point, 
I slowly flanked his position on the opposite side that had followed us through this thick, dark and foreboding land. The centre dogman's eye exploded and head kicked backwards violently and a thick squirt of blood, brains and skull splattered back onto the cold rock behind him. The other dogman instantly turned towards Jimmy's position and roared. Seconds later, another shot went off. I quickly followed suit from the other side of the clearing and began firing on them with an M16 rifle, aiming for their torso. Immediately, another one dropped hard to the ground as Jimmy's shot wrecked its way through another dogman's skull and messily left through the back of its cranium. One left, I said, as my assault took its toll and it fell to its knees and began convulsing. Jimmy and I exited our position of cover and met in the clearing before unloading the rest of my M16 directly into its head. Smoke was left pluming from the end of my rifle. 126, yes, get in, Jimmy said aloud. Eh? You what? I questioned. 126 headshots on my sniper tally. I never miss, bro. He responded, looking very pleased with himself. Jeez, Jimmy, mate, I added. You ready for this? He asked. No, not really, <laughs> I replied. All right then, let's go kill some bad dogs, eh? And with that, we set off into the cave. The smell was far worse down there. A combination of urine, rots and death coated the inside of our mouths, leaving us both gagging at first before we became accustomed to it. Either that or it just killed our senses altogether. It was pitch black and the further we descended, only the trickling of water running between rocks accompanied us. <coughs> Boomed from deeper in the tunnel. Then a scream. It was short, but it was definitely Faze. Jimmy and I looked at each other, shocked. She's still alive! I whispered excitedly. We ran up ahead and were met with two tunnels splitting off. We should stick together, I suggested. Yeah, okay. Let's take this one. Jimmy replied, pointing to the tunnel on the right. We set off and within minutes we could feel a rush of fresh air from deeper within and the sound of rushing water below our feet. Again, another short scream echoed through the tunnel. More and more bones littered the hard ground around our feet the deeper and deeper that we progressed. Ten minutes or so later, we passed a hole in the rock and could see white water rushing past in a channel below us. We rounded a corner and it opened into a larger chamber. There, at the back of the chamber, laying on the cold, hard, unforgiving ground, was Faye. In my excitement, I rushed towards her before Jimmy could stop me. I made it to her side and scooped her up in my arms, turning. I see my mistake as Jimmy screamed and started firing upon four dogmen coming on all fours from a smaller tunnel. I had to run with Faye in my arms, desperately trying to make it over to Jimmy's position again. Suddenly, five more came smashing through the overhead rock from that tunnel also. Jimmy threw two flashbang grenades at them, stalling them as they covered their eyes from the blinding light. We just made it as I set Faye down and turned to help Jimmy fire on the oncoming dogmen, now advancing on us again. Out of nowhere, three more appeared from the tunnel behind us. It was a trap all along, I shouted to Jimmy over the sounds of gunfire. Get her out of here now, Dan! Jimmy screamed at me, pointing towards the small but suitable hole in the tunnel's side. The river! I shouted. Yes! Go now before they get closer! I'll be right behind you! Jimmy replied, grabbing me by the collar. But Jimmy! I tried to question. Still, the dogman grew closer, and then a tainted ammunition taking its effect on some of them. But more and more were appearing. Where one had fallen, two more would replace it. Suddenly the ancients arrived and began tearing their way through the dogmen behind us. And the Sasquatch were with them, easily towering over the others like a giant ten or twelve feet high. They picked the others up and rammed their faces and heads into the rock until they were nothing but bloody pulp. I wasted no more time and grabbed Faye. You come right after me, Jimmy. No hero shit, okay? I said one last time before throwing Faye and myself into the cold rushing water below the caves. The water was breathtakingly cold and I struggled to gain my breath and keep Faye's head above water. There was an enormous loud explosion from above and the rocks and dust came crashing down behind us. Then, seconds later, we rounded a bend and my side took an impact on some hard rocks, breaking a couple of my ribs in the process. Eventually, the water slowed and we were met with blinding sunlight as the water washed us out into a marshy wetland. We waited for Jimmy, but... He didn't show. I had to get Faye and I back to the cabin and then to a hospital. I wandered for about two hours, up and down hills in wet marsh before finally I made it to a road. 
I walked up that road hoping to God someone would drive through before my injuries and hypothermia were too much and I ended up collapsing in the road with Faye also unconscious. I awoke in hospital, 22 hours later with Faye beside me. She was going to be fine save for a few cuts and a broken arm. I was given a clean bill also, escaping with a few cuts and my shoulder being used as a dog toy left a nasty scar and the broken ribs, but we would live. On returning to the cabin, it was strange. As we stepped out of the taxi, the place was alive with sounds of nature, birds singing, bugs chirped. It was like a whole different place altogether. Faye turned and smiled at me and said, second time lucky? I laughed and said, yeah, I guess so baby. After resting and watching a bit of Netflix, I was checking in Jimmy's room for his bottle of whiskey that we'd given him when he arrived. In the drawer of his bedside table, it lay. Underneath, there was a handwritten note to me. Hello, mate. If you're reading this, then I didn't make it. It was always going to be a one-way trip for me anyway, Dan. These creatures are too dangerous, clever, and need to be stopped. There are too many for our bullets. Hell, even the damn government's best team couldn't beat them. You have a chance at something great, Dan. Something your mother would be proud of. You know she's made me promise that I would look after you back in high school, right? You have always been there for me, and put up with my shit, whatever and wherever. No questions. I love you like a brother, Dan. Remember, be lucky. Love, Jimmy. I was stunned. I didn't move from his bed for ages until Faye came in and read the note herself. She and I cried for most of that evening. Eventually, life went back to a semi-normal. We named the fishing lake Jimmy Spot, and we settled down to a married life again. Well, almost. Except for the odd ancients visit during the early hours. We respect them and supplied a well-stocked amount of lamb, and life went on. Six months later. Hi, welcome to Jimmy Spot. How many of you, and how long are you planning on staying for? Oh, uh, just a weekend, please. Four people. Fantastic. Choose a spot and we'll settle up when you leave. Have a great time. With that, the small family headed off down the dirt road towards the fishing lake. Life had begun to take a normal approach day in, day out. The business was doing well and life seemed to be almost perfect. My phone suddenly received a text from an unknown number. I opened it to read. Hope they like dogs. See you soon. Jimmy. Wow. Hope you guys enjoyed this series as much as I have, uh, you know, creating it and working with you all during the comments and, and getting feedback on where we should take this. Um, an immensely, immensely enjoyable process. And uh, I hope you guys, again, have enjoyed that as much as I. Uh, I look forward to writing a brand new series soon. But for now, uh, we'll do some short stories, I think. Um, again, please do let me know down below in the comments what you thought. Again, please do like and share. If you haven't subscribed to DMT, please do smash the subscribe button and hit the notification bell to stay up to date with all Dead Man Talking Forest of Fear content. We have a lot of exciting stuff coming up in the next few weeks. I love you guys. Thank you all so much for your support and kind words. And remember, if you're taking a trip to the Lake District, and possibly around the Winlatter Forest area, keep your eyes open and be aware of your surroundings. And above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.